Uh, good morning. Welcome on this uh, gray uh, Monday morning at 9 o'clock. Um, you all get a gold star by your name for showing up. Um, uh, my name is Robin West. I'm here with the uh, Energy and National Security Program at CSIS. Uh, and it is my pleasure to, to uh, introduce our speaker and moderate uh, the panel. Uh, our lead speaker this morning um, is uh, Chris Smith, who's the Assistant Secretary of Energy um, for Fossil Energy uh, with responsibilities for the Office of Operations. And uh, he manages the oversight of fossil energy research and development and the U.S. Petroleum Reserves. Uh, he has uh, been in um, uh, uh, the Energy Department now for six years. Um, and um, he has a, uh, he was in the industry, he was uh, uh, in finance, and I, um, I, I always thought he had suspiciously good posture. And I realized that the reason for that is he went to West Point. Um, anyway, I, um, uh, Chris is going to talk for about 10 or 15 minutes. He is going to answer a few questions, and then he has to leave. So um, get your questions in promptly, uh, and then uh, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, our panelists, uh, Jennifer and uh, David Goldwyn, who will then talk about the substance of the report. Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Well, thank you, Robin, for that uh, really kind introduction. I'm going to have to pay particular attention to my posture as I stand up here uh, as to not to disappoint. Um, so uh, thank you, and thank you to CSI, uh, CSIS for, for inviting me here. It's a, it's a privilege to talk to this group of, of senior decision makers and, and subject matter experts about a topic that we think is, is really important, which is the engagement between the United States government and uh, the governments throughout the, the continent of, of Africa. I also want to thank CSIS uh, for the, uh, the report, which, uh, which was recently uh, done, which uh, David will hold up, right? Um, which I don't have a copy of, right? but nicely done. Um, it, it, I, I, it's hard to overstate the degree to which we, we benefit from uh, work like this that helps us think through some of the, the bigger fundamental issues about where we should be focusing, uh, how we take uh, our capabilities as, as government and uh, end up making the right type of, uh, of decisions and investments uh, and commitments so that we can, we can move the ball, the ball forward. So uh, we really appreciate this type of, of clear thinking that helps us, helps us think about what we should be doing, what, should we, what we should be working on. Um, the continent of Africa, as, as all of you know, is a, is a focus for, for us, is a focus for this administration. It's a focus particularly for, uh, for this president. You'll be all familiar with the, the Africa Leadership Summit that the President uh, sponsored here in Washington, D.C. last year and all the events throughout the United States that, were, uh, that went on on the, on the shoulders of that event, uh, a really important engagement for us. Uh, we're aware that the, the President will be uh, visiting the continent here uh, very shortly. And so uh, a lot of our efforts uh, as we <coughs> circumnavigate the, the globe and, and work on all the things we're working on are are being focused on, on the continent of, of Africa. Uh, last year we had a, 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 a seminal event, a really important event, which was the U.S. Africa Energy Ministerial that was uh, co-hosted by uh, my boss, the Secretary of Energy, uh, Dr. Ernie Moniz, and the Secretary of Energy, uh, the Minister of Energy in, in Ethiopia. That was, a, that was a really, really impressive event and one you know, that, was, that made a really big impact on me. Uh, 30 countries throughout the, the, uh, throughout the, the continent uh, participated. We had full ministers from, uh, from, from 30 different countries. Uh, great pent-up demand for that type of high-level engagement between the United States government and uh, the governments of, uh, throughout Africa. So that was something that, that made an impression on me and it made a big impression on, on our secretary. And his instruction to me was, and to all, to all of the department was, you know, you have one of these events where, you know, you get dozens of senior leaders throughout the world together. Uh, you talk about what you can do together. Uh, you realize some of your commonalities. You, you point out some things that you can do together uh, more effectively. And without, you know, the blocking and tackling, without the, 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 the constant kind of hard work that comes right after that, what will happen is that this, this will kind of rise up like this desert flower. You'll do this beautiful thing. And then three years ago, three years from now, when we get back together, we don't want to make the main talking point that thing we did three years ago. 
We want to make sure that in real time we're moving the ball, that we are continuing with these engagements and we're finding ways that the United States government can be effectively engaged with governments throughout the country, uh, throughout the continent. One of the themes of all the discussions we had was this pivot from a relationship of, of aid to a relationship of, of, of true partnership. Um, I think that was something that came through both uh, in the comments that we heard from senior leaders throughout the continent and that was expressed certainly by, by our leadership as, uh, as we had a, a lot of really, really uh, fruitful discussions. And so it's an opportunity for us to see the potential of the continent in terms of uh, commercial opportunities, uh, the potential of the continent in terms of leaders throughout the continent doing all the things that they need to do to bring prosperity to, to, to their countries, and opportunities to create real, meaningful, bilateral partnerships between the United States government and uh, the government of, 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 the, various, various, uh, of the various countries. Um, I had the, uh, the opportunity to share the, the stage with uh, uh, who was at the time the, the energy minister from Kenya, Mr. Davis Shearshear. And uh, at one point in his, in his dialogue, and this was to an audience of, of energy experts in Houston, he, he made the, uh, you know, the very emphatic statement that, that to remind folks that you know, Africa is a continent, right? It's a big place. Uh, there is lots and lots of diversity, and sometimes when we think about these engagements, um, we forget about the incredible amount of diversity that you have uh, between the, the societies. As I, as I, as I always uh, spent time with our Secretary of Energy, uh, Dr. Moniz, uh, I, I went from, at one point, a, a bilateral engagement with uh, the minister from uh, Nigeria to a bilateral engagement with the minister from Uganda uh, to uh, a third bilat with the, the energy minister from, from Algeria. Uh, three really, really different sets of challenges uh, three really different sets of opportunities, and we're having to, to make sure that we're, we're focusing our efforts in a way that, uh, that, that takes the, the unique things that we can do, the unique things that we can bring, and tailors them to each one of the, the opportunities. Um, so there's no, there's no, um, there's no one-size-fits-all approach. So I'm going to be headed to, uh, to, to Africa here uh, at the end of, of this month. I'll be traveling to uh, Kenya. Uh, Mozambique, Tanzania. Our effort, or you know, our, our intent is to make this a true whole of effort, uh, whole of government effort. You know, as I was, um, uh, as, as I was having a conversation a few minutes ago, uh, before I came up on the stage, we're talking about this uh, um, Beyond the Grid initiative that we're that we're managing. I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. But Beyond the Grid involves 40 U.S. government agencies. You know, four zero, 40 agencies. And uh, there's a reason for that, right? Because there's a lot of equities, there's lots of interest. Uh, that can be a good thing, right? Because we, we, we like uh, initiatives that certainly uh, pull these multiple agencies together. But that, that can be a, a lot of cats, cats to herd in terms of getting 40 agencies, 40, uh, 40 separate entities aligned in, in one direction. So we're making a real effort in these engagements to make sure that as, uh, as I travel, as, as, as other senior, senior leaders throughout the U.S. government travel, that we do have a true whole of government uh, um, uh, effort, that we do have you know, one set of talking points, and that we are representing each other's programs effectively. So I'm, I'm working very closely with um, the Bureau of Energy and Natural Resources from the Department of State, which uh, uh, David used to run. I'm working closely with, with TDA, I'm working closely with USAID and the Power Africa uh, effort. And in that, I'm spending time with Amos Hochstein, with Andy Hershowitz, with, uh, with Lee Zak. Uh, we've got one message of engagement, and it's our hope that as, as uh, you know, the, the, the four of us traveling around the continent, we're not going to be in the same place at the same time, but we do want to make sure that we're delivering uh, one, one message. So the, uh, the, the focus for the Department of Energy and, and for my, the office I lead in particular, so I'm the, I'm the Assistant Secretary for, for Fossil Energy at DOE, so I handle uh, the Fossil Energy portfolio. Uh, the Department of Energy, as many of you know, is primarily a technical agency. You know, we're not the regulator. We're, we're not the rule maker. Uh, we do primarily focus on research and development. We've got the uh, network of national laboratories where we've got you know, over 10,000 scientists and, and engineers dedicated to the, uh, the broadest uh, swath of, of, of R&D for, for 
energy, energy topics. So that gives us a, 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 unique, a unique capability. So the, the focus that, that, that my office has is really on emerging producers. It's on uh, those countries that have significant resources in place, uh, significant potential, but have not yet uh, gone all the way down the, uh, the road to commercialization. And there's a gr in, 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 these, in these societies, there's a tremendous opportunity to, to take that potential and turn it into real wealth cre creation for that society, real energy security for those countries, and therefore energy security for the entire world because it's a, it's a positive thing to see these barrels come onto market. It's also a positive thing to see the stabilizing influence that prudent development can bring when that development uh, creates a prosperity that, that, that permeates the society. And so, th therefore, that's the, the reason I'm, I'm traveling to these, these first uh, three countries that I'm going to be focusing on, uh, Kenya, Mozambique, and, uh, and Tanzania. Um, as I've had the opportunity to talk to leaders uh, from throughout the country, uh, throughout the continent, uh, you do see that there's, uh, there's tremendous pressures, first of all, uh, to get this right. Uh, there is, as I mentioned earlier, I think a lot of pent-up demand for meaningful high-level high engagement with the, the United States. I think there's interest in trying to take some of the best practices that have been developed around the world and bring them to Africa in a way uh, that, that assists uh, those countries into uh, putting, in put for, putting forward the right regulatory framework, uh, thinking about what institutional uh, building that they need to do domestically, uh, thinking about negotiating with the international oil companies so that they bring the right type of investments, and basically putting in, forth in place a framework so that uh, when that money starts flowing, when the oil starts rolling, when revenues and, and royalties uh, start coming into place, that the, they, they've set up a structure that accomplishes what they, what they want to accomplish. And in that, you know, one of the things that we, that we do emphasize is we can't go anywhere and, and tell people how to develop their resources. Uh, that, that's not our intent and that's not our interest. Uh, but we certainly do have some experiences here, some of which have been positive, some of which uh, have been challenges. And one of the goals that we have is to ensure that uh, some of the, the good things we've learned that we can share and some of the bad things we, that we've learned, uh, we can ensure that they don't, they don't get replicated. I mean, I was the, uh, you know, many of these, these resources are going to be developed offshore. I was the, uh, the federal official for the commission that President Obama created during the, uh, the Deepwater Horizon disaster. And so that's uh, an experience that I, uh, I lived through with uh, uh, you know, very close to that, to, that, to that very, very difficult situation. And I, I can say that that was an event that happened in U.S. territorial waters in the, in the Gulf of Mexico with a, on a, uh, you know, in, uh, in a, uh, in a uh, U.S. context. But when something like that happens, it doesn't just impact producers in the United States, it impacts everybody in the world. Similarly, um, an event elsewhere is not just going to impact the country where, where that event uh, happens. It's going to impact uh, every, everywhere in the world. And so in that we've learned from some of our, some of our mistakes, and in that we've learned from some difficult experiences we've had here, it helps us, I think, inform that, that debate uh, internationally. And so we want to try to take that opportunity. Um, I'll also have an opportunity to, to speak about our Power Africa initiative, and I think we'll, we'll hear some more about Power Africa here today, but uh, the effort to put in place uh, 30,000 megawatts, 30 gigawatts of power throughout, uh, throughout Africa. Uh, that's been expanded to, to the entire continent. There's a, over a $7 billion commitment and loan guarantees, and a lot of work going into place to not only find projects, but also work with companies to take investments to Africa and work with local governments to help put in place those type of regulatory frameworks that will, that will attract those investments. Again, part of that pivot from, from aid to, to, to partnership. Uh, with regard to the Department of Energy, we, we've got a great benefit or uh, a great assets in our national laboratories. Uh, that's a tremendous scientific resource that I think is of, of interest to, to countries throughout the continent. Uh, so we're going to continue to, to make the national laboratories uh, available and look for, for opportunities to create partnerships. Uh, one thing that we, that we see consistently as we talk to senior leaders throughout the continent is, in, is an interest in creating educational partnerships where we could send uh, students back and forth between, uh, between our countries. Uh, that's going to be a continued area of focus. And there's, um, 
I think, uh, an approach that we, can, that we can create that will be, I think, relevant to, to many, countries, many countries in the region. Um, a last initiative I'll, I'll mention is the, the Beyond the Grid initiative. Uh, that's the, the one that, I've, that, I, that I referred to earlier that, that's got so many government agencies. Uh, but our focus there on Beyond the Grid is developing technical expertise. And so um, uh, NREL, our National Re 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 Renewable Laboratory in Golden, Colorado, will be uh, supporting that effort, looking at technical support for micro microgrids. Um, as I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to talk about today, the, as, as, as countries throughout the continent face the challenge of bringing electricity, reliable power to, uh, to, to uh, people throughout the continent who don't have access to power, the, increasingly those systems are going to be distributed power generation uh, systems. are going to be different from the systems that we've, that we've created here in the United States. And that requires not only uh, some technical expertise, which I think we can, we can partner on, but also uh, the regulatory framework that will allow those investments to get in, put in place to be able to run, uh, to be run efficiently. Uh, so that's going to be one of our uh, efforts that we'll be supporting uh, with the goal of connecting 25 million households throughout the country, throughout the, the continent to, to reliable, reliable power. Um, so big topic, um, and you'll hear, I think, a lot more uh, detail from our subject matter experts. We, we crib, I think, a lot of our of our direction and, and our strategy from our reports like the, the report that was created here by CSIS um, um, uh, about uh, Africa's new energy producers. And uh, so with, with that, again, I'd, I'd like to thank CSIS not only for giving me the opportunity to, to be here, but also uh, for this, uh, I think, informative report that's really helping us to think about how to, how to engage in some, some, some real challenging opportunities, but, but ones which are, are truly important to us, they're important for this president, they're important for this administration, and, and particularly important for our, for our secretary. So with that, thanks for having me here, and I'd, and I'd be glad to, to take a, a couple of questions if there are any. Are there any questions for Chris? Sir. Hi, could you talk a little bit more about what the administration is doing in more of the frontier markets like Somalia and Puntland, Somaliland, uh, if, if anything? Thank yeah. You. So um, I'm not going to have too many details on that. I, I know that they, as we've, we've expanded uh, Power Africa and beyond the grid to beyond the six initial focus countries to, to, to have a, uh, a, uh, a broader look, uh, we're, we're able to, to bring a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot more countries into, into the fold. Uh, when Power Africa was kicked off, you know, one of the, obviously the, the, the countries that were initially included were, were happy, and, but the countries that were not initially included, the first uh, lead off on all those conversations, well, you know, why not, why not our country? And so this will give us an opportunity to, to focus not only those initial, those, those initial focus countries, but also uh, some other countries throughout the region. So the, um, you know, I, I had an opportunity to spend some time with uh, Andy Hersowitz uh, a couple days ago, and his, um, you know, they've got a big goal, you know, 30 gigawatts throughout the, the continent. It's, it's enormous. And in order to get that to work, you need big, big projects in the places where you've got lots and lots of people and potentially the ability to bring lots of money and lots of people to pay for, for projects. Um, so it's difficult to get to that big goal by cobbling together lots and lots of small, say, solar distributed power generation uh, projects. But that said, um, it, there's a realization that's still really important. Uh, it, it's still critical to, to make sure you're not only reaching to the to large countries, but also to, to some of the, the smaller frontier areas where you know, getting, getting you know, power out to those places is, is, is more challenging. And that's our hope that we can create you know, some business models that we can replicate uh, that might be able to get scaled up and you can get some big numbers out of them as well. Uh, so that, that remains to be seen, but it's, um, it, it's a goal that we have. It's something we're, we're endeavoring to accomplish and, and you know, we'll, we'll see what we're, what we're able to do. I'm George Ward from the Institute for Defense Analyses. Uh, when you travel to uh, Kenya, Mozambique, and Tanzania, uh, 
what is your estimate of what you're going to hear from interlocutors there about the, their uh, prospects for developing their new resources in an era of reduced prices and also building the infrastructure that they need? Yeah, so that's, um, that's another big challenge. I mean, as we know, uh, oil prices are where they are, and it's a you know, naturally volatile commodity. So I, when, I, when I get to talk, to talk about oil prices, it's usually in, in context of our R&D portfolio, and I try to make the point that you know, we can't chase the commodity curve. Um, you know, when I joined Texaco back in 1998, uh, oil was at you know, $13 WTI. Um, in 2008, right before I came here, it was at 140 um, and then it whips, it whips back and forth. So it's, it's a more challenging environment now. Um, uh, it, it's more difficult, certainly, to get some of these projects put in place at $50 than it was at, at $100. But it's our, you know, it's our belief that, that companies do take this volatility into, into account when they're doing their long-term forecasting. Uh, the short end of the curve whips around, but you know, over the long term, um, you know, we, we think that the challenges you know, don't move the same way that the, the short end of the, of the, of the futures curve uh, moves around. Uh, but it does make things harder. Right, it, it brings a little bit more leverage uh, to those companies that are they're bringing those investment dollars, and uh, it it makes it a little harder for countries that are trying to to attract attract those uh, uh, attract those investment dollars. I mean, the, the investors going to be pounding the table about, well, you know, I need to make sure I'm bringing the return to my shareholder. Uh, so that's going to be one of the one of our topics of discussion. In fact, I'm uh, David and I are both headed down to to Houston. Um, I'm going to be appearing on a panel where we're going to be talking about that, that specific topic about um, Africa and development in a, in a low-price uh, low environment. Um, so it's a challenge, and I, I expect to hear them tell me, well, gosh, it's really hard, and <laughs> you know, that's, I think that's what they're going to tell me. Um, and I guess uh, what you know, our, our response is going to be that you know, these, are, these are volatile commodities, but uh, um, these, are, these are decadal investments. Right. These are investments that are going to be in place for, for 30, uh, 40 years in some cases. Uh, so you know the countries, the companies that are going to be bringing that type of investment to these these economies are going to be thinking for the long term, and you know your your eye has to be on the on the horizon. Yep. Last uh, question. Oh, sorry. Um, Mark Harrison with the United Methodist Church Office. Um, how are, is there, is there an overall plan that you have as you do this work with Africa that addresses that the U.S. role is to promote uh, non-fossil fuels or where are we on that one and climate change? Because you didn't mention that. I didn't hear that you were very clear on that. You know, I know you work in the fossil fuel industry. All right. And then as you travel to Africa, and meet with governments. What is your strategy and outreach to meet with African civil society? Okay. Well, thanks for the question, and, and actually, that's, that's a real, real big one. So most of our most of our programs. So again, we're we're primarily a technical agency, and most of what we focus on is reducing the carbon intensity of our of our energy systems. So reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, to try to get CO2 down to sustainable levels. Now there are some challenges when you're, and we we have some other. That's not our only goal. Our, our other goals are energy security um, and uh, um, uh, economic prosperity, jobs, et cetera. So we do have to do both. And there are some challenges when you're trying to bring uh, more energy to a greater population of of, uh, of people around the world at the same time be be cognizant of of issues dealing with greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so some of the distributed power generation. Um, approaches will be lower emissions, and we think that's really important. Uh, we think that it's also important to, to get additional uh, barrels onto the, onto the market, be it oil and natural gas, and natural gas is, is explicitly part of the solution, I think, for a clean energy economy of the future. So we have to figure out how to, how to, how to do both. Um, in terms of engaging with, with civil society, you know, we're going to take our, our cues primarily from, initially, from the, uh, the governments that we're, that we're engaging with. But as we build relationships, and, and this is you know, not a short-term thing, uh, getting deeper uh, contacts, I think, with, with different diverse areas of civil society will be, will be increasingly important. I'm going to have to cut this off now because right. I'm going to have to cut this off because Chris has to leave. Um, right. But thank you, Chris, very thank much you. for getting this st program started today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.
turn to the, the panel. Um, first, I wanted to thank uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, sponsors. Uh, uh, okay, I wanted to thank the sponsors um, uh, for the conference, which is Chevron, um, which supported the report. Um, Africa's new energy producers making the most of emergent opportunities, as well as the government of Denmark, which is supporting CSIS's work on power generation renewables in Africa. So um, let me now turn to uh, uh, our uh, two uh, uh, panelists here, uh, Jennifer uh, Cook and David Goldwyn. They're both very well qualified on Africa and energy matters. Um, and I'm sure you're, I won't go into their bios, but just say they are extremely well qualified. And a lot of work has gone into this, I think, very thoughtful um, report. And so let me turn it over to you guys. Thanks, Robin. Um, and thank you all for joining us on this Monday morning. Um, uh, on the report, I want to say a big thanks to David Goldwyn, who's a senior associate of the Africa program, who joined with us on this report. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Ladislaw, who's the director of the CSIS um, Energy and National Security Program, who is in Sarah uh, as we speak, um, could not join us as a co-chair of the project. Um, and a working group of uh, members of a, uh, that included uh, corporations, that included members of civil society and non-governmental organizations, energy analysts and experts, uh, development experts in Africa, policy experts. And so it was a really great diverse group of people, I think, uh, that brought a, a whole diversity of perspectives, which I think are reflected uh, in, the, in the final report. Um, we began the report in uh, the working group sessions in late 2013. Um, through to 2014. This was released in January. So prices were kind of plummeting as the thing went into the press. And, um, uh, but I think most of the findings still hold, although there are some adjustments perhaps in the timelines and, and so forth that we can talk about. So first of all, the impetus of this report was really um, the, the great buzz about uh, Africa's energy sector, um, the high expectations and the excitement around the new oil discoveries along the East African Rift, which uh, stretch from Somaliland, Somaliland and Puntland, that border uh, that Elliot mentioned, uh, down through Kenya, Uganda, Eastern DRC, all the way to Madagascar. Uh, deep water discoveries off the coast of West Africa, uh, off Mauritania, exploration going off of Senegal, Liberia, Sierra Leone. Uh, and then, of course, the world-class uh, natural gas discoveries off the coasts of Mozambique and Tanzania. So Africa really seemed ready, uh, poised for a hydrocarbon boom, and hopes and expectations of what that might mean uh, for economies was permeating discussions from the very local level, and you had uh, Turkana communities in, in Kenya uh, striking and shutting down uh, Tullo's operations uh, because of jobs and, and production was nowhere even near to beginning yet. You had uh, debates in Tanzania over the placement of a refinery and a pipeline with local communities where the, where the gas was uh, closest to demanding that. So local debates, uh, national parliamentary debates. You had practically the Ugandan parliament coming to, to blows practically over some of the legislation. Uh, electoral politics in places like Ghana and, and Mozambique. Um, uh, among development experts and especially among investors. And one of the things that the report points out is this kind of proliferation of new investors, a, a much broader array. You have the international oil corporations, the kind of long-standing traditional big players in Africa, but a growing mix of much smaller expeditionary uh, companies that have been at the forefront of some of the finds. You have the Chinese, although they don't play quite as dramatic a role as is sometimes uh, portrayed in uh, news media, uh, gobbling up all, all the opportunities. In fact, they've come in as a, as a partner on many of these internationally structured deals. Um, you have national oil companies uh, in, in Angola and Nigeria and, and elsewhere likely to crop up and become more powerful and, and more, uh, more assertive. And then you have a, a crop of indigenous African companies, um, particularly right now in Nigeria. Um, if you've seen with external actors reluctant to go in, you've seen this crop of, of, of Nigerian companies, some, some of which are doing quite well, some of which are 
are not, but um, that's the that's life in, in the oil sector, um, I suppose. So the, the with this task force and with this report, we wanted to ask um, a number of questions. First, we wanted to do something of a reality check. So with all this buzz and excitement, these big new resources, how real really is this opportunity? Uh, what is the resource base? Uh, what is the potential? And how does Africa line up with other global opportunities in oil and gas um, elsewhere in the world. It, these, are, these resources are coming on stream at a time of big flux in, in both gas and oil markets, um, and, and uh, uh, particularly for the U.S., for example. Um, second what was, what is it going to take to move from these early finds in some places uh, to production, getting the kinds of investment you need to get to production, uh, to revenue generation, to uh, successful and effective natural resource management that can drive the long-term inclusive development and growth um, that we all, I think, want to see um, within Africa. Um, third, what is it going to take to avoid uh, the mistakes and the traps into which pretty much every single African energy producer has fallen at some point or the other? Uh, the creation of an enclave economy with uh, elite capture of rents, uh, cronyism and corrupt deals uh, within the sector, uh, and disinvestment into other sectors of, of the economy. Nigeria, once the breadbasket of West Africa, when oil came, uh, kind of like kids uh, at a soccer match, they say, following the, the Following the oil became the only game in town. Meanwhile, agriculture in the north collapsed, manufacturing, and so forth. Uh, and that is something I think that a Ghana does not want to see, or, or, or a Tanzania, uh, or a Uganda. And then finally, what does this mean for U.S. interests and for U.S. policy responses more broadly? Um, what model? and what models and what kinds of partnerships are out there, and David's going to talk a little bit about this, that hold promise uh, in terms of creating shared value. Uh, how is it that the U.S. and others can help these countries? And that means help the governments, um, help investors, uh, importantly, I think, helping civil society to understand the sector, uh, and help citizens to really maximize the benefits um, uh, of, of this resource and avoid the resource curse. Um, so what are some of the key just basic outlines? First of all, the traditional producers are not out of the game by any means. They still remain, particularly in oil, uh, the big game in town uh, with significant growth potential still, although you know we know in, there are reasons in Nigeria that growth has slowed but because of the petroleum industry bill and the failure to pass that. But there's still a great deal of growth there. And in terms of scale, really, you're talking in 2014, Nigeria produced uh, 2.4 um, million barrels per day, uh, Angola 1.7. Ghana is hoping to double its production by 2017 to 250,000 barrels per day. Um, anyone in the audience can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but we are talking kind of a, a, a very different kind of scale from the traditional oil producers to the new ones. Nonetheless, those resources for a Ghana, for a Uganda, uh, for a Kenya, uh, for a Somaliland or Somalia, God, God help us, uh, could be very significant in um, economic transformation. <clears throat> in gas, uh, Mozambique and Tanzania are the big story. Uh, the magnitude of the fines, the proximity to Asian markets. Uh, these fines are relatively close to shore compared to, for example, in Australia, so technically uh, not so difficult to recover if you can get the infrastructure in place. Uh, and then Africa is one of the last places where big international oil companies um, can really gain significant access. Um, uh, and, and they're coming, these resources are coming on stream at a time when energy demand, at least over the long term, is going to continue to grow um, in oil and gas, driven in large part by the Asian market, um, even if short-term uncertainty in demand and price um, uh, stretch things out a little longer. 
In terms of the opportunity for producing companies, uh, countries, uh, if producing states can get it right, there are obvious benefits uh, in eventual production shares, in the royalties and taxation, and, and the revenues that this can generate for those governments. Um, should they put it to good use. But there's also the possibility that the new investments draw major new investment um, uh, in infrastructure, in roads, in pipelines, in deep water ports, in rails, that are gonna have impacts for Africa well beyond the energy sector and can drive regional integration, can drive more global trade. To have uh, deep water ports off the coast of East Africa that can handle the kind of capacity uh, that is uh, not, that these ports are not able to meet yet is huge. Standard Bank uh, anticipates that this, these new energy fines will drive $1.5 trillion in investment um, in coming years to Africa. Um, in Kenya, for example, the discovery of oil in, um, in Uganda, in Ethiopia, and in Kenya has really uh, spurred further development of the Port Lamu uh, development and the broad corridor that they would like to build that includes port, power, rail across northern Kenya that will connect Uganda, will connect South Sudan, will connect Ethiopia. Uh, and even if they just get part of that project right, it doesn't, the, full, uh, the full fruition may be many years off, but even if they get part of that right, uh, that means huge things in terms of potential economic development for northern Kenya, and certainly for regional integration uh, beyond kind of the traditional EAC architecture. Um, further, uh, Africa, we, we've, we've heard from Chris Smith, has a major power deficit. Uh, it generates, you can fit, in, in terms of land mass, you can fit the United States, China, India, and Europe into Africa. And Africa as a continent produces about the same megawatts as Spain in terms of electricity. So there's a huge unmet need in electricity. That's a big part of US policy push and one of uh, President Obama's kind of signature efforts is to try to address that, try to address that gap. So there are big hopes around these new resources in terms of uh, gas to power projects, although that's very complicated and not quite so straightforward as it seems, and I think that's something we address to some extent in the report, but I think warrants uh, a lot further uh, exploration as well. Um, and gas to industry projects. Nigeria has, has seen, after kind of a slow start, it's seen um, real very positive trends in, in driving a petrochemical and fertilizer industry and kind of a small uh, plastics uh, uh, manufacturing uh, around the um, oil in the Niger Delta. Uh, so there are big opportunities at, as there. But there are ma major caveats at each step of this. And I think uh, one of the struggles uh, of, of the task force was striking the right balance between kind of um, uh, exuberant hope and despair. And this, <laughs> uh, we did not want to say that this was doomed enterprise. Uh, but on the other hand, there are major challenges that need to be overcome. Uh, first, there are these big uncertainties in the energy markets. Uh, the oil price drop, is, as I said, is going to draw out timelines a, a very long time. Over the long run, that may not matter so much, but in the short run, with expectations uh, so very high, um, that, could be, uh, that could be very problematic. And in natural gas, uh, it, markets and prices are extremely uncertain, and natural gas, uh, because of the high capital expenditures will cry it up front and the very long tail of returns, investors need real certainty around uh, who's going to purchase this and at what price over the long run before they take these major decisions. Um, so in, in gas in particular, I think the timelines uh, become even more uncertain. Uh, and these are in places where uh, uh, there's great uncertainty over the sector as a whole. They're creating a sector on the fly. Uh, regulatory frameworks do not exist. Political stability in a place like Mozambique is very much in question. It's emerged from civil war. They're still uh, had a contentious election cycle. There are other opportunities in the world, in the United States, in Australia, where you don't, you know, okay, even there it's uncertain, but you don't have to worry as much about the rule of law, political stability, uh, and so forth. Um, so over the long term, these resources 
will be developed. The demand is such that they will be development. But the timelines, uh, the terms, and the returns on them will be very uncertain. And, and one of the points of this report is that African producers are going to have to work extra hard and extra fast um, to be attractive to um, uh, the average investor. David's going to talk a little bit about some of the cha those challenges kind of in greater depth and how best the U.S. Uh, working with producer governments and investors and citizens uh, can create the shared value. But just one final word on U.S. interests. Uh, U.S. imports of African oil have dropped dramatically in recent years. Uh, we were one of the largest consumers of African oil, we, the United States. 25% uh, or more of the continent's production uh, was purchased by the United States in 2010. Uh, but since 2010, uh, U.S. imports from Africa have been cut uh, by 90%, uh, from 2 million barrels per day, uh, in 2010 to 170,000 uh, today. So this is a, a dramatic drop. And I think many, many think, well, well, why do we care what happens in the African oil sector anymore? We're really not that dependent on it. Um, obviously, I think there's still a very strong interest in ensuring that these resources are uh, developed in a responsible, uh, sustainable way. Uh, the, we, uh, the, we have a glo global oil market uh, today. The U.S. is very much interested in a diverse supply and steady um, prices and, and, and uncertainty. Um, so there's, there's the basic energy security uh, interest. Um, U.S. companies still remain very much in the mix, even if U.S. Uh, doesn't purchase as much of, of the oil. Uh, the, the big international oil companies, but also, as I said, these smaller companies, many of which are U.S.-based, uh, who are at the forefront of exploration. Um, U.S. has a commercial interest in ensuring that there's a level playing field, that U.S. companies are well positioned to compete, um, that contract and procurement are fair and transparent, and that investment opportunities in some of these countries do not become overly politicized and become kind of political footballs on geopolitical interests and so forth. Um, in development terms, as U.S. assistant flows are kind of under, under pressure and constrained, uh, these new resources and the revenues they generate offer a huge new opportunity to kind of spur economic growth um, and uh, uh, and if well managed, drive the kind of longer term private sector led uh, uh, development, employment, and beneficiation, I, I think that much of our uh, development assistance uh, focuses on. Uh, so there's a strong development interest as well. Uh, we want to ensure that these resources are used in a way that amplify private sector and uh, uh, create diversification and employment, I guess. Um, Third, we want to make sure, uh, in diplomatic terms, uh, the U.S. will want to be wary of the potentially destabilizing uh, uh, consequences of the, this high-value commodity and this kind of influx of, of new resources. As I said, in some places, you've already seen heightened political competition in elections, in parliament, and so forth. Um, you talk about uh, the possibility of of oil uh, in Somalia that doesn't yet have a constitution, and that just you just you can just imagine that whole exercise, which was di difficult to begin with, overlaid with uh, possible oil resource, and it becomes a big complex mess. Um, uh, political stability at the national level, political stability and uh, security at, at communal level. I talked about some of the protests that have been gearing up around this. Um, and in interstate contact, uh, content over uh, conflict over land, over maritime borders, over, over uh, lake borders. The, the, in Somalia, unfortunately, the, the fines uh, straddle the Puntland Somaliland border where you already have huge political tensions and you, uh, you put a resource dispute on top of that and it, and it deepens that even further. Um, and then finally, at the internet, uh, and then in security as well, if you have these massive new infrastructures, a big corridor uh, traversing northern Kenya, do you have a high value target for potential militia or terrorist strikes? And that's uh, 
same in the maritime domain. I think uh, that's something uh, that, uh, that countries will need to be extremely uh, wary of. And then finally, at the international level, the United States uh, has an interest in uh, championing, championing uh, successful, responsible investment. Um, it doesn't want to be seen dragging its feet on standards of transparency, on responsible government, on environmental stewardship, and the consequences that uh, these energy resources could have there. Uh, or on resource, ma resource management. So uh, at multiple levels, in development, commercial, uh, security, diplomacy, and at the global level, uh, the U.S. has uh, a great deal of interest in how these resources are developed. So I'll turn to David. And um... Great. Thanks, Jennifer. And it's always a pleasure to partner with, uh, with you and with CSIS. I think this is my third opportunity to do a, a task force. And, and CSIS is really quite fortunate to have Robin West as a counselor who's had so much experience designing these kinds of systems in a service to the U.S. government and advising companies and governments in his, in his, prior, in his prior life. I think, Jennifer, you stated it well. I mean, the, the opportunities here are, are huge. Um, Long-term demand for oil and gas remains large despite a great growth in renewables. Natural gas particularly would be important for conversion, for climate change, for conversion from coal and from diesel to something for baseload energy a little farther down the, the carbon chain, potentially over a trillion dollars of investment uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and we've learned a lot, uh, I think, over the last 15 years about how to do development better. We've learned about the importance of transparency, um, about disclosure, uh, about having uh, more sustainable bargains. And so the real fundamental question uh, that we had for the new producer, producers in this report is, will this time be different? And the answer we came to is that it probably could be different, that you might end up with having real progress on development and less corruption and more sustainable systems. But in order for that to happen, companies, donor governments, and external governments are going to have to engage much earlier in the process, really before anything is drilled, um, and much more robustly than they have ever done before. And that's because all of the hard work of setting up the framework comes at the very beginning, when you let the contract, when you put the acreage out, and when you, and you invite, uh, invite your, uh, your investors in. And so we looked at really three key challenges in whether this time could be different. The first one is this, this low price cycle. And that's you know, a problem for, particularly for the big projects in Mozambique and Tanzania, because you have um, uh, a lot of projects chasing a smaller amount of dollars. Um, and so uh, companies may be different in size, but they are the same in motivation. They're looking at return on investment. What do they put in? What percentage do they get out? How quickly do they de-risk the project? And is it, uh, is it, is it secure to get their, their money out? Um, and so in that sense, um, countries and their frameworks have to compete with each other for those dollars. And I think right now, the changes that we've seen in Mozambique and in Tanzania, looking for greater shares to go to the domestic market, having changes in taxation, are making these frameworks less competitive, not more. And to give Tanzania as an example, you're talking about a $20 billion project to have this LNG capacity there. The, the, I think the, the GDP of Tanzania is $20 billion. So, you know, as you may know, you know, when companies invest, the early, they spend it, you know, the curve kind of looks like this. Exploration, you drill a couple of wells, that costs in the tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. But when you get to the, the, the point of development, we're going to drill your 20 wells and build your land base, then you're in the billions. And you have to make that final investment decision, which is, we know what the resource looks like, do we go forward? That's where they are now. And that's where the competition is. So it is, frankly, an open question whether or not African governments will win this competition or whether Mozambique and Tanzania in particular will, will be delayed. And you see um, Mexico adjusting its framework in mid-reform uh, and other countries trying to compete for these dollars. So I think it's a serious challenge, not because prices are low and companies can't make money, but because the framework has to be more competitive to reach a final investment decision now. The second, the second challenge that uh, Jennifer alluded to is this new character of investor. The good news is that the mid-sized companies, the Tullos and Anadarkos, discovered resources that the big companies didn't find. Big companies are great at running projects. They seem to be not so great at finding oil and gas. Uh, and so were it not for these mid-sized companies, no one would know that the resources existed in Sierra Leone, Liberia, offshore Mozambique. 
But these companies are typically not the long-term operators of these projects. And so Anadarko is a fantastic company. I don't think it's ever run a large-scale LNG project. You see them selling a little to India, to ONGC, maybe to, maybe to others. And that's the typical cycle of these, as Robin can speak to better than I, the, you know, they find it and then they flip it. But in order to have um, the kind of um, project management you need, that's going to change. And now the question is, who's going to buy and at what price and will they sell at the bottom of the market? So that's another factor, and for a reason I'm going to get to third, which is the need for shared value. And I think this is really the big lesson that we've learned over the last 15 years, that increasingly for a project to be sustainable and to survive multiple political administrations, each of which want to extract some value from that project and, and show that they're able to deliver the goods, you have to have a kind of a framework that can last for 30 years or 40 years. And so on the front end, it means the investor has to show people who are not right in the neighborhood of the project that the country is getting some value out of this. And some of it, as you know, Jennifer's alluded to, means that the country has to share those revenues and promise it will go to the whole country, not just to the neighborhood. But some of that has to do with the company, which is you know, how far out do they build the road? If they're setting up telecom for themselves, do they do it for the whole neighborhood? Where does the airport go? If you're bringing in gas, how much of that gas is going to go to, to fund local electricity? And in order for the project to be welcome, more of that value has to be delivered early when the company is in the spend mode rather than when it's in the profit mode. And that is generally for the first eight or 10 years of the project. Well, when prices were north of $100, there was a lot of chatter in the industry about shared value and delivering value and investing this. You know, at $50, you know, you're not hearing as much chatter about shared value, and the mid-sized companies that I was talking about are not the ones that have the, the resources or the margin to deliver shared value. So what happens next, I think, makes a big difference. The other thing is that countries need to strike sustainable bargains. They need to have a royalty that varies when the price of oil varies, so that the people don't feel like they're getting robbed when prices are going high, and so the company doesn't walk away when prices are low. You have to have a kind of scheme that means when you have to spend more money on the tail end of a project in order to extract resources, that it's not unprofitable so the, comp so the company walks away. And it's complicated stuff. It's hard to get right. There are real questions of fairness. And so the need for countries who are new to oil and gas development to have the lawyers, the engineers, the scientists, the economists who will give them the confidence that they are getting a fair deal for the country needs to come before anybody in the country is going to spend more on you know, hiring more people for their, their version of the Department of Interior. We have a hard enough time hiring people for our Department of the Interior, and we're a pretty wealthy country. And so this is the asymmetry, is the value, the investment in, needs to come early in the process, but all the money comes later. So that leads us to our three pillars of sort of you know, policy change that has to happen. Uh, in order for this time to be different. And the, the first, most obviously, is building government capacity early. And, um, and I think there has been great work here, you know, uh, compared to 10 years ago. The African Development Bank, the IMF, the World Bank all have technical assistance programs. There are, you know, probably more consultants per capita in Mozambique than there are maybe even in Washington. So you have a lot of, you know, a lot of people in there giving advice. The donor coordination could be a little bit better than it is. But people have had the idea that you need to invest early. I started a little program when I was at the Department of State, the Energy Governance and Capacity in Initiative, which was just having feds, the U.S. Geological Survey, do introduction to seismic processing, so you, the country knows what it's got. You know, but we could do eight countries. You know, there are a lot more countries that need a, a lot more help. So building that capacity is early, and because there are so many different donors doing this, donor coordination would make a big deal so that you could get different kinds of advice and go deeper. The second thing that we've learned is to really prioritize transparency and accountability. Um, you know, now we have a lot more of these petroleum funds, we have a lot more uh, standardization of contracts so that the contracts can be made more public, um, so that the terms can be made more public. Uh, Mexico, and we're here talking about Africa, but the system they have set up is probably best in class in terms of, uh, of transparency from how the revenue gets published um, uh, to, um, to how the framework works. But also procurement matters, because a lot of corruption happens in procurement. And it happens in local content. And so every country wants to build up local content. But if you set local content too high, and all you need is a, a host government hat for that 
company to be considered local, you're basically manufacturing a rent-seeking operation by giving people a license to, to own that local content. I mean, you look at some of the corruption in Brazil right now and the Petrobras scandal, and some of that might be traceable to the fact that Petrobras had to be the operator for every new project, and they had high local content, and so everybody knows where they've got to go to shop. So, so it's, it's hard to get the percentage right. And again, I'd point to Mexico as having a sort of a variable system that's tried to, to strike this right. But also we've learned a lot about disclosure, EITI, funds that publish things. Um, who knows what will happen with, uh, with Dodd-Frank, but we are on the trend already in Europe towards high levels of disclosure in Europe at the project level, and I think we'll figure out a definition in the next year or so and have that in the United States. But the idea is so that people will know what is in the system. Now those, as my friend Charles McPherson from the World Bank you know, used to say, those are outputs, not outcomes. You know, and so this is all important information, but it doesn't actually produce better governance. Um, but I think um, uh, it's essential in order to create it. And on this category of promoting shared value, here's where it really falls on governments to share the wealth early and make sure that the whole country is gonna, is gonna benefit from this. But you also have to build community support. And so there's a lot of discussion in the NGO community about local consent. People have to know what's coming, what's in it for them, and since it's a capital-intensive industry, companies have to figure out what's going to be in it for them. Um, uh, it, it is a great opportunity that you can create a platform for small and medium-sized enterprises, for plumbing, for electricity, for food, for transport. And if you could plan at a large scale, like Jennifer has talked about in Fort Lamu and other places, you can figure out you get the gas, you get the electricity, you get transportation, you can grow the whole economy. And so um, it, the challenge there is that that is a that requires a top-down planning process from the countries. It, cause, it requires intergovernmental cooperation. And all of this is happening before anybody's making any money. This is all while it's sort of prospectively eight or 10 years out. So it's a big lift. And so uh, I, I'd close with um, uh, gratuitous advice to my colleagues in the US government. I've already given it to, to Chris, but it's fun to be on the outside and give people impossible jobs to do. But, um, <laughs> But I think the first is, um, is, to, is to take a next step and really step up um, our bilateral assistance in this capacity building. We do a little bit in different places, but it's under-resourced. Um, and we can do it by sending feds overseas, but, but I think we really need to deliver there. The second is to support the efforts of the multilateral development banks, and we have not done as well as we could in supporting reform in these institutions, but the idea that they channel their assistance, uh, including into the hydrocarbon sector, um, because we can promote climate change, but we have to promote development at the same time. And Africa is going to develop these resources, so we need to be um, unembarrassed about investing in the technical capacity for these governments to do that well. I think we need to support some of this cross-investment, which really takes um, some, some support in helping governments facilitate this, uh, this regional planning. And we can planning, and we can also step up our, our diplomacy, as Chris is doing by going overseas and the pres President's trip to Africa, as the State Department is doing. Um, you know, very often we lose a lot of our diplomatic capital to crises in the Middle East and regular meetings with Europe. Um, and so, you know, we are in the tail end of the administration ramping up the engagement with Africa on a number of levels, but it doesn't take that many people, it doesn't take that much time, but the time to do it is now, because the frameworks, the infrastructure, the planning for these countries is going to happen for good or for ill in the next five years, and we'll be living with it for the next 30. And so um, that leads me back to where we started with uh, the, the question here, making the most of emerging opportunities. This time can be different, it's gonna be really hard, but I think if we, we push at the donor level and the US government level and at the country level, uh, I think we can do it. Thank you. <clears throat> As you may have gathered, this is a, a really a very serious effort. I, um, I think this whole fundamental question of governance, there are huge resources there. The question is getting gov governments right, and I think the, the point that was made, and I think it's a very good point, is that governments have to realize they're competing. There's a world market for investment. And if you create terms that are not sustainable, the companies will leave. They'll go elsewhere. And uh, um, um, particularly in a low price environment. So I think a practical approach, and I think this is, unlike a lot of Washington uh, projects, this is really a very practical project. I, I, congratulate you too. Now, um, we just have a few minutes. Um, and so what I'm going to do is let's take a few questions. 
and then uh, we'll just take the questions and refer it to you all, and then we have to stop. So, sir. Good morning. My name is Lawrence Jones. I'm with Alston Grid. I'm also the chairman of something called the Center for Sustainable Development in Africa. Um, Jennifer, thanks for uh, an excellent report. Uh, I have a question. Um, there's not enough time to sort of uh, ask specific questions, but I just want to ask a contrarian question and, and ask us to just pause for a second. I think you mentioned caveats, and I think, David, you talk about a lot of, you know, if then and these things that have to happen. Can we imagine a scenario where none of this resource in Africa was made known and was tapped? And Africa and African governments had to develop without knowledge of these resources. How would the trajectory of the development go? And the reason I bring this up because right now in Liberia and many other African smaller countries, these governments are throwing their entire hope and future on something that hasn't even been dug out of the ground. And to some extent, while this is good, it is sort of a deferring their focus on development fundamental strategies on how they're going to move forward. So I'm just asking the question, I mean, are we, uh, I mean, the, not the hype, but the issue of the buzz and the expectation that has been set. If this fails, then what? And so assuming these things were not known, because most of these African countries, even the big ones, don't even have their own geological studies institute. They're being told that the resources exist. They don't know for a fact. They're guessing. So if it's not there, what have we done? Thanks. Hi, I'm Sasanka from Oxfam. Uh, thank you for that. That was really interesting. Um, I want to unpack quickly, uh, if you could elaborate on two things. Uh, Jennifer, you mentioned a distinction between gas to power and gas to industry. Um, and I'm really glad to hear that because there is a distinction between the two. And you said that the the uh, the former was a little bit not as straightforward. Um, be curious to get some elaboration. And if there's time, David, I'm curious on your reforms of the MDBs that you suggested right at the end there. That would be uh, beneficial towards this. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Yon Gitiro Taram, U.S. African Development Foundation, so I'm part of the Power Africa Whole of Government Initiative. And I wanted to just have a brief comment on, I know this is focuses on fossil fuel generation, on uh, clean energy and a, uh, a mix uh, with uh, the large potential for solar in Africa and, um, and the hydro and the geothermal even and uh, biomass and biogas. And just get your comments on that. Thank you. Um, my name is Chris Shabin. I'm with the Department of Energy. And I'm just curious to know your thoughts on, on tight resources, um, how you're thinking about this in the context of, of more standard oil and gas plays in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and what resources are sort of there right now and what needs to be there for local comp companies and international companies to take advantage of those. Okay. Sure. Um, well, on the first one, Lawrence, uh, kind of you hit the nail on the head there. Um, and, and I think part of the impetus of this report was to say it's not that straightforward. And I, I think, you know, particularly in a place like, like Liberia and Sierra Leone, which uh, you know, emerging from conflict, they're still at a fairly low base. You look at a Kenya, which has been fairly strategic about developing renewables, about developing uh, its power sector and getting kind of the, the structure of the power sector right and, uh, you know, without a lot of resources and promise. You know, the, the, the oil finds are fairly recent and they're still very, very early on. Um, or you look at, um, you know, you can look at some of the non-resource wealthy countries, and Ethiopia even, who's looking to other, you know, hydro is the is a big, even as, you know, there may be maybe some oil fines. But yes, for a country like Liberia and Sierra Leone, and uh, it's very iffy if the resources are there or, or commercial in any way. Um, and I think that's a major task for the Liberian government is to, you want to be hopeful to your, you know, in, uh, to your citizenry, but you don't want to raise expectations around something that's not there. And um, the, the, the problem is, you know, you see some of the headlines, even when Uganda 
uh, found oil, you know, next to Kuwait, to, you know, the, the, this, this hyper, hyperbole is, is very dangerous in the long run, I think. So that's so exactly right. On the, on the power to, uh, on the gas to power, um, again, it sounds kind of like natural gas, big power deficit, perfect match. But the fact is that, you know, governments have to make the hard decision of whether you export the natural gas, or whether you export the gas, which is probably gets you a slightly better rate of return, is much more attractive to investors who, who see a much steadier market there, or if you use it for domestic use, particularly in a place where in Mozambique, like Mozambique or, or Tanzania, where yes, there's a huge deficit, but the the I don't know the, the technical term, the, the present demand is just not there, and you don't have the market that's going to buy up uh, uh, that, that power generated uh, unless it's heavily subsidized by the government. And so an investor looking at uh, producing power for a market that's heavily subsidized by the government that's also kind of reliant on them for returns, uh, I think makes it a very difficult proposition. Tanzania and Mozambique both currently use some of their natural gas, uh, Mozambique very little for domestic consumption, but kind of as, a, as big investors go in to, to exploit the, the big resources, that trade-off uh, will become, uh, I think, much more difficult. It's something we point to in the report. Their efforts uh, in, in Ghana even as well, um, you know, do you, can you create a, a regional market so that you have a, a, a surer purchaser at the end of the day or an anchor industry like mining that will, that will buy up the power that's generated when you use it domestically? So those are some of the uncertainties around that. Um, that uh, on, the, on the renewables mix, I'm not sure that I quite got the question right. Um, but look, so many countries don't have these fossil fuels uh, at all, uh, is one. Um, uh, the, the second is that these, these may help generate uh, power, um, well, some of it may be for export, some of it may be kind of on-grid power generation, um, but a hugely unmet demand is in kind of off-grid in rural areas and so forth, uh, where these kinds of resources are not gonna be um, as economic uh, in the long term as other kind of renewable uh, resources, wind, uh, solar, and so forth. Um, I'll leave the last one to you. <laughs> Great. Well, I would, I'll take a very briefly a, a yeah. shot at a couple of them. I mean, for one, I, I think Liberia and Sierra Leone may very well disappoint. And so you wonder if they never, you know, the most successful countries in Africa are ones that don't, you know, don't have, aren't resource rich, and so you have a more diversified economy. This is an opportunity to have a big investment in education and infrastructure. If governments do it, you don't have the capital if you don't discover it. So that's why they're, they're developing it. But um, it, it, nobody has really gotten it right, except for Norway, and they had an industrial base to begin with. And so um, you know, that's why we're sober-eyed about the challenge. Uh, I think on the MDBs, I think my, my point is that um, we have failed to make room for the new emerging economies and the governance of the large institutions, and they have a huge stake in the governance of these countries going forward, and so I think um, it would be better to do that. Second, I think um, we have had a period of extreme ideology with respect to um, MDB investment, uh, particularly in the gas sector, which in my own view is deeply misguided because um, these governments are gonna need baseload energy as well as distributed energy, and you're not gonna reduce those, you know, we ought to be about greenhouse gas reduction, not purely about promotion of renewable energy, and I think if you were less discriminatory about gas, then, you know, you might, you know, instead of the Madupi coal reactor in South Africa, maybe they'd have gas if they had access to gas, but they don't have access to gas. So those are the choices. So we, I think I, a little less ideology, a little more practicality, and I think the uh, getting the emerging markets in would help. Um, I think on, uh, and that really leads to the electricity question too, is if you get prices right, which is market pricing for gas and market pricing for electricity, and you just subsidize the poor, then the market will decide whether you know, renewable energy or gas or other is gonna be the source of feedstock. And big companies don't invest in countries to produce for the domestic market. They produce to export to the global market for a global price. So it's really all about getting prices right, as pretty much all development work is, and just subsidizing the people who need it, but not having the big industrials pay anything other than a market rate. And I think that's where you're gonna get your mix of renewables, distributed, and baseload energy. You can't forget about baseload energy. I mean, South Africa needs three gigawatts 
you know, you're gonna like cover Johannesburg in windmills even to produce three gigawatts. I mean, it's just, it's not realistic. So it will be all of the above if you get prices right. And Chris, your question, I think on, when you meant tight resources, you mean unconventionals, the prospect for unconventionals in, in Africa, I think is um, on a resource basis, uh, you have South Africa, the Karoo Basin, and Algeria, and Libya, more North Africa, uh, but I think um, unlikely. Uh, South Africa because of water scarcity, also you don't have the infrastructure, you don't have the, uh, you don't have the framework there, um, and there's so many other resources. So I think at some day, if it's still needed, they might develop it. Um, uh, I think it's only really in North Africa and places in the Middle East, Jordan, Morocco, where they don't really have another choice where unconventionals make sense. But, um, you know, why Algeria needs to do unconventionals, I, I really couldn't figure that out. And I think in sub-Saharan Africa, with the exception of South Africa, I don't think that the, um, the resource is there. Okay. Um, I think it's time to wrap it up. Uh, thank you all very much. As I say, I think this is a, a, um, um, really a, a very uh, solid report, and I think the bottom line of the whole thing is the quality of governance. That's the key to all of this. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, sir. I think we're going to move fairly quickly to our next panel, which goes into greater detail on the renewables. So if I...
Yeah, yeah. I talked to him recently. He told me he was uh, starting to slow down. Okay, if people can begin to make their way back to their seats, we can get on with the, the brave new frontier of renewables. We'll herd those uh, coffee drinkers in. Okay, well, um, so much for fossil fuels. Uh, coming out of uh, last week's Bloomberg New Energy Finance Summit, uh, one of the headlines was fossil fuels just lost the race against renewables, uh, the beginning of the end. Uh, so um, we've, we've done oil and gas in Africa. Um, now I think we'll look to um, the big excitement that's happening now around renewables. Um, wind, solar, hydropower, biomass projects, all of which are gonna play um, a major role in meeting Africa's growing power needs. <clears throat> uh, there are big possibilities in utility scale projects. Uh, you think of places like Inga Dam, uh, Ethiopia, Ghana, um, but equally important is the role that renewables will play in getting access, uh, getting power access to the vast majority of Africans uh, who live in remote or rural areas uh, and who do not have access to a centralized grid. Uh, renewables uh, play, uh, will likely play a huge role in this um, through off-grid and mini-grid applications that can bring huge benefits in terms of uh, development in education, in health, and in powering small and medium enterprises. Um, the, the, as I said, the vast majority of Africans are likely um, to work in the, in the foreseeable future. So there's lots of ex excitement in renewables, there's lots of innovation, there's a slew of entrepreneurs. Uh, Lawrence Jones, who, who asked a question in the first one, is kind of at the heart of some of the exciting kind of small uh, uh, enterprises and, and innovative technology, use of technologies uh, that are happening. But there are, as in oil and gas, a number of big challenges uh, facing uh, renewables. And I think we're going to hear, again, we want a little bit of a reality check today on what are the upside possibilities for renewable energy in Africa. But with, the, with all this excitement, what are some of the big challenges? I think one of them is scale, for example, and financing. Uh, how do you, how do you, uh, uh, and I think Diana will talk about kind of how do you aggregate many kind of micro projects that can have huge impact, but that are, that kind of strain the bandwidth of, of uh, companies and, and institutions that are seeking to finance them. Um, so we have a terrific panel of expertise here today, um, each of which, uh, each of whom looks at different aspects and uh, different stages of kind of getting projects uh, from uh, idea to implementation. Uh, to start off, we're going to start with Ethan Zindler, um, who's head of the Americas and head of policy at Bloomberg New Energy and Finance. He's also a senior associate in, uh, of the CSIS Energy and National Security Program. Uh, Ethan, we're very fortunate to have him. He just had an exhausting week in New York uh, talking about this. And uh, Ethan, maybe you can say a little bit 
how or whether Africa factored into some of those conversations there. Uh, we'll next turn to Zephyr Taylor, who's a clean energy lead at USAID, uh, working on, on helping, uh, helping renewables project kind of makes, make the business case and get, get set up to receive financing. Uh, we have Diane Jensen, who is managing director uh, for renewable energy at OPIC. Um, and then finally, we have Jeff Leonard, who's president and CEO of the Global Environment Fund, which offers grants and, and a, is a private equity firm, but offers also grants in project preparation um, for renewable energy um, uh, projects and entrepreneurs. I thought we would just start, Ethan, perhaps you can give us the big picture and kind of what you see in terms of the big opportunities and the challenges, and then turn uh, to, to each of our panelists for, for for, from their perspective and where they sit, what are the big obstacles and, and possibilities here? So Ethan, why don't you start us off here? Sure, okay, uh, and will this work? Uh, if you move the mouse to the, oh, here comes Ben. Sorry guys. Anyway, I'm Ethan Zindler with Bloomberg New Energy Finance, as was mentioned. Uh, thanks so much for hosting me here today. Um, uh, it's great to be at CSIS and to have the, the very minor role that I have here. Um, I, uh, uh, I had our, our group in the Americas. I also write a lot about policy. I'm not our, our, our you know, official uh, Africa expert, so that's sort of my caveat for the day. We have great people in Cape Town uh, and in London who are very focused on this area, and I'll show you some of their re research in just a moment. Um, for those of you who don't know us, Bloomberg New Energy Finance is a division of Bloomberg that is essentially an energy market research firm, uh, and we did hold that conference last week. Um, for the record, though, we did not write the headline that, renew that we think that, uh, that renewables have won. Um, we did say that there was more re renewable energy capacity installed last year than there was um, fossil capacity installed globally. Um, and then uh, a headline writer who writes opinions for, for another part of Bloomberg said that renewables won. Uh, we're a little more practical about this. Um, we, d we do think we've entered an era of, of real price competition between renewables and fossil generation. Um, and in some parts of the world right now, um, renewable energy is clearly the best option. Um, but in others, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, and I think it's important to be practical um, about this. Um, I'm going to just start talking through my first slide because um, I kind of generally know what it says. But here, go ahead. Just use these right here. Oh, this way, yep. way simpler than I thought. Yeah. Or was it? Well, we'll get it. Oh. Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. My fault. My fault. Um, anyway, we, our firm, um, as may have been mentioned earlier, we track we track investment globally in renewables and in uh, and in fossil, um, and over the last um, six years or so. We've tracked about $60 billion that's gone into Sub-Saharan Africa um, on what we would call uh, non-new renewable energy uh, capacity. So this would be uh, fossil plus um, large hydro. And about 32 gigawatts of capacity was installed with that $60 billion over that period. Um, this has come in a variety of forms. It's pretty lumpy. Different years see a lot more money than other years, depending on big projects being financed. A uh, big coal project in South Africa really accounts for a big chunk of that. Um, and generally speaking, when you talk about Africa and you try and split the numbers about money, it does become a lot about South Africa versus all the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa because so much of the money does end up uh, in South Africa. Um, the next slide, which is a nice picture of, uh, is, uh, is about, is about um, shows renewable energy investment. Um, and we've tracked um, about, uh, about two gigawatts of capacity being added per year in the last several years. Uh, and again, a lot of the concentration has been in South Africa. South Africa has been very active in holding um, power auctions for renewables uh, and these tenders that have been won. But there's also the big Lake Turkana wind project in Kenya as well and, and a bunch of geothermal that's been developed um, as well uh, as uh, renewables become more cost competitive um, across the region. Um, I show, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, that has been intriguing to us, certainly in tracking the money, is the, uh, the sources of the capital. Um, and uh, China has been very, um, has been very involved um, in financing uh, activity in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, in particular the China uh, Export-Import Bank. 
Um, I think, if I recall, it's about $5 billion that we tracked um, uh, of that total $60 billion, and, and frankly, it may be more. That's the $5 billion that's been documented. There's also undisclosed deals um, as well. So China's, with, by our calculation, has been the, you know, that, that institution was the largest uh, single investor, but there were others on the list as well. Um, one of the things uh, within the context of Africa I think it's worth really thinking about is the concept of cost competitiveness for renewables. Um, and I only I focus on this for one second only in the context of the fact that um, my sense is, and I certainly invite the panel to disagree with me, but my sense is that there's a bit of a schism within the development finance community about the role that renewables can play now. Um, at the very top of the of these organizations, like at the World Bank and elsewhere, um, you know, there are pronouncements about not wanting to spend any more development finance money on building new coal. Um, but institutionally, within I think some of these organizations, there is not yet the belief that that renewables can be the low cost option, and that if you really do that, if development is your number one priority, then coal is the way to go. So I think there's actually a bit of a split there. I think that that's a discussion that's ongoing. Um, for our part, you know, we did a big study uh, this past year, which I talked about here at CSIS some months ago, called Climate Scope, where we surveyed um, we surveyed 55 developing countries around the world, including 18 in sub-Saharan Africa. We looked at a whole lot of different things, but among other things, we, we did gather a lot of information about uh, electricity prices, and I certainly welcome folks, thank you, Ben. Um, I welcome folks to, to go to um, global-climatescope.org to take a look at some of the data that we collected, but among other things that we looked at, I guess I said, were retail and wholesale electricity prices in these different markets. And this is a very kind of crude comparison, but I just kind of want to make one basic point here, which is that when you look at the price of electricity um, that's being paid in some of these markets, it far exceeds the levelized cost of electricity for wind and solar technologies. Okay, so what's, what's LCOE? What's the levelized cost of electricity? It is a calculation that we do and others do, um, looking essentially at what would be the price at which you'd have to sell your power to earn a reasonable rate of return. In our case, we calculate around 11% internal rate of return for an equity holder of that project. How much would you have to sell your juice for to earn that reasonable rate of return? And on a global basis, the average for solar, as you can see, is somewhere in the range of about $140 by our calculation, and it's somewhere around $75, $80 for wind. By comparison, if you look to the left of this chart, you can see that some of the wholesale prices in these countries um, I'm going to go back. I didn't touch it. Okay. Um, the, the wholesale prices in some of these countries, including you can see a few of the prices on the countries on the list from sub-Saharan Africa, are far in excess of this. Now, I point out that this is a crude kind of comparison, but my basic point is that if you can finance wind and solar at the kind of rates that you can finance it, it in other countries, they can truly be cost competitive. They can be a lower cost option than the price at which electricity is being paid for in a number of these markets. And so I guess I only, I invite anybody who says, well, it's, it's one or the other, it's development or it's clean energy. That is, that's wrong. Um, that's just, if you're not more carefully looking at the technology costs as of literally, you know, the last couple months, then, then you're using old data because the price at which we've seen clean energy costs come down has been so rapid and so dramatic that you need to look very, very currently. I'm not saying that every project everywhere, solar beats, you know, beats coal, you know, wind beats coal, but I am saying is it's not a simple conversation and the economics need to be looked at um, carefully. Uh, just a quick look in terms of where we see things going. Um, you know, our forecast for the next several years, South Africa, as I said, it's really South Africa and kind of everybody else in, in sub-Saharan Africa in terms of where the renewable energy market is. Um, the forecast on the left for South Africa is really largely based around the kinds of auctions that they've held to uh, build new projects and our forecast forward for how much capacity we think is going to be built. You know, it's roughly four or five gigawatts of new capacity is going to be added of renewables in South Africa. We know this is pretty, pretty major given that basically the entire capacity almost entirely in South Africa to date is coal, as you might expect, given the local resources. So it's a big shift. And then if you look elsewhere, you can see, you know, we're expecting two to three gigawatts of capacity being added in other countries as well. 
with geothermal playing an important role, um, given some of the outstanding resources that are there uh, on the continent. So finally, I'm going to say one quick uh, word about um, off-grid, um, because I do think um, it's, it's really worth um, talking about. You know, I don't know what the latest estimate is. I think it's maybe half a billion people are without basic access to energy um, uh, on the African continent uh, still. And um, there's some incredibly interesting things going on in this off-grid space that frankly falls under a lot of people's radar. It's, none of it is reflected in the dollar figures that I just showed because we're counting big projects. Um, but there is a slew of new companies, and they are companies. They're not, um, they're not nonprofits. They're not NGOs. They're companies looking to make money um, that are fostering a development of off-grid um, access to electricity through using the latest technologies. And, and I think what they do is extremely cool. Um, and obviously, a number of venture capitalists in Silicon Valley are starting to think that as well. Um, these companies last year, um, by our calculation, raised about $80 million in venture capital. This year alone, a handful of them have raised another $40 million. And what they do uh, is they essentially, in many cases, offer so-called pay-as-you-go um, solar electricity. So what you're seeing here is a company called Phoenix. Um, these guys are really interesting. Two former uh, Apple, uh, I think, programmers who started this company about five years ago. That device that you see there, essentially, um, you can go uh, to your local phone provider. I think they're operating in Tanzania. Uh, and essentially, you, you take that home. You give them a small amount of money um, to take that device home. Um, and then uh, what it can do is it can generate um, power that you can use to plug your phone, um, which you see at the bottom of the picture is a, is a USB cord, and then at the other end is uh, multiple plugs for pl charging your phone. It also has a light, which is that sort of bent thing there. And apologies, the, I, I was the photographer. So um, um, this was at the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association meeting several weeks ago in New York. Um, but the way it works, though, is that, is that you pay as you go, meaning you take the system home, and then you essentially buy a certain amount of, of kilowatt hours by paying over your mobile phone, in much the way funds are transferred. And then once you've paid and you've used as much juice as you can, well, then you can buy some more, again, over your mobile phone. You get sent a code back, you plug the code into the, the device, and that gives you access. Um, the size of the market for off-grid, this is very hard to, to know at this point. By one estimate, it's a half a billion dollars in activity that took place last year. It's been growing at like you know 100% rate for the last several years. And the kind of innovation that's going on there is really fascinating because it uses mobile phone technology, mobile money technology, and it capitalizes on the fact that photovoltaic costs have come down so dramatically that this stuff actually can make a lot of sense. So if you put down 20 or $30 to take one of these home and then you spend you know, 50 cents per, you know, per day on electricity thereafter, um, if, you, if you pencil the math out on what you were spending on kerosene, the, the numbers can start to work pretty quickly um, if you're in a remote village somewhere. And of course, you don't have the health risks associated with kerosene and you don't have the un unpredictability about the cost of the kerosene, and you don't have the inconvenience of having to go to get the kerosene um, to light your home. So this is an area of real interest. What these guys need, though, and what, they're, what the challenge that they're running into is they need working capital. They need debt capital to finance the expansion of this. Yes, they're raising equity from the venture funds, but the debt money is a bit more of a challenge for them to come up with. But it is, in my view, perhaps the most exciting development that's going on in sub-Saharan Africa, given the sheer number of people without energy access. So with that, I'm going to stop, and I'll hand it to, uh, to Diana. And I'm hoping if I just keep clicking, we'll get to your slide. Yeah, right. There we go. Okay, good. Sorry. So thanks for including me. Um, and I think what I'll do with this presentation is try to do a very quick overview first, just who and what, OP, you know, who OPIC is, what we do, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the institution, and then get into sort of what we're seeing in renewable energy and the trajectory of our lending in the sector. So to start off, um, OPIC is the U.S. government's development finance institution. So any Anybody who's familiar with the International Finance Corporation or Asian Development Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, African Development Bank, we do the same thing. We provide financing 
four projects in emerging markets. And we have a dual mission. One is to facilitate U.S. capital into those markets where commercial banks would be unlikely to lend. And the second prong of that is to support development in those markets. And as you can see there, uh, OPIC was established in 1950s, and we currently have a portfolio of $18 billion worth of uh, debt, uh, debt investments. And so just as a highlight to give you a sense of where we are with renewable energy, uh, we committed $1.2 billion in loans uh, in our last fiscal year and, um, you know, supporting everything from larger solar projects, you know, CSP projects in South Africa to very, very small scale projects. And this gives you an idea of where we were in 2007 and 2008 along with everybody else. No one was lending to renewable energy projects and the huge growth that has occurred in the last five years. And again, here you can see the vast majority of our portfolio in uh, renewable energy is in solar and then followed by wind. And then geographically, it's largely dominated by Latin American Caribbean, and uh, that has a lot to do with a number of projects, solar projects we supported in, in Chile in that year. This is a program that is specifically aimed at supporting Africa energy solutions. Uh, OPIC was uh, provided a partnership with State Department, um, Trade and Development Agency, and USAID, and we were given $20 million to help support early stage investment in, these t in small renewable projects in Africa. So the idea being that a lot of the projects that we see for financing have, you know, they need feasibility studies, they need some early stage money to get them to the point where they might actually be a viable candidate for financing. So this is purely grant funding that was deployed. Um, and there are a couple projects mentioned there that, that uh, demonstrate our, our role in Africa to date. And so as part of the Power Africa initiative, we've supported big, big and small projects. And this is the background on the Clean Energy Fund that where we're supporting um, early stage uh, financing. Again, in, I shouldn't say financing, in the form of grants. And what we've essentially achieved over the last year was we supported that $20 million was deployed to 30 projects in 10 different countries in Africa. And it's gone to mini grids, small scale distribution, um, to describe, for instance, some of the types of projects that Ethan was describing. We've uh, provided funding to, to those types of companies. So this is sort of going from the in the box home solar solution that Phoenix has developed, where you can plug in and have a light bulb and, and charge your phone, to actually a mini grid where you're hitting a, a, a number of villages, and usually that's with, um, with solar. And this is a bit outdated. So as I said, it was, it's a total now of 30 projects with the 20 million and in, in, in 10 countries. And this just gives you a sense of who we work with. And I think that this is relevant. Uh, you know, when I first started at OPIC many years ago, we did big investments. We did a lot of conventional power. It was, you know, with big companies and it's changed dramatically. I mean, we work with NGOs. We work with impact investors, investment funds, you know, private sector companies. We interact a lot more with other government agencies, and, and it's a much broader sort of uh, range of types of investments we support and with a much larger groups of, of partners. And this is just, you know, a quick look at sort of the history of OPIC and how much investment we've supported and a demonstration effect really that so much more of this money is going into, um, into renewables, into impact invest, investment. And that's it. And I just wanted to make a quick point on Africa specifically, and I just want to, I was just looking at some notes that we had from a, a piece that our press office did. And it, Right now, 25% of our global portfolio is in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in 2013, we committed $1 billion to Sub-Saharan Africa. And now our entire active portfolio in the region, in Sub-Saharan, is, is $4 billion. 
And I wanted just to also talk quickly about these types of projects that um, you know Ethan referred to and the challenges for an institution like OPIC. You know, I, right now I'm currently working on two or three very small scale projects in Africa, one in wind, um, another in solar, and these two are, are very actively moving along. And I think the challenge for an investor and, uh, and a lot of financial institutions is that these projects are, are small scale, they're in difficult markets, you have investors, a lot of t uh, often entrepreneurs who are just sort of getting into an area. They, they have ex very varying experience globally that may not be familiar with the, mar the market that they're going into. And you have foreign exchange risk. For an, for, you know, OPIC only lends in dollars, so we always have foreign exchange risk. On a large project, you hedge it, you enter swaps, you get into these very complex financial arrangements. And that's a challenge for us on small projects where that's not an option. And it's an additional risk we have to be willing to take. You have assets that are, in the case of doing, for instance, like 100 villages with you know, a solar solution or this you know, in-the-box home solar system, your assets are spread out all over the place. You know, how, as a lender, do you take collateral on a, on, a, on a financial transaction like that. So there are a lot of risks and a lot of structuring concerns that we have to think about. And uh, the development finance institutions globally, I think, are really just starting to lend to these sectors. Up until this point, it's been a lot of you know, uh, initial investment coming from investment funds and venture capital and um, grants and impact investors, and, and it's just now starting to get to the point where I think that institutions like OPIC are willing to take a little bit more risk on some of these smaller investments um, because everybody's looking at scalability, right? Once you do 10 villages or 100 villages, then it's the 1,000, the, two, the 2,000 villages. And does it really make sense for these utilities to be building transmission lines out to rural parts of these countries where there aren't that many customers, the customers that you're serving don't consume a lot. They they really don't have the financial resources to consume a lot. So it doesn't make sense in many of these places for these utilities to get power out to these people. So then the only solution is to think of these, these off-grid solutions. And I think in development finance institutions realize that if we're willing to take a little bit more risk on some of these first projects where it's just a few villages, with really strong partnerships that the next time it's gonna be a much, you know, it's gonna be the thousand villages. And, and at that point, I think you're gonna see an enormous growth in, in this whole sector. <coughs> Zephyr. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, thanks to CSIS for having me as well. Um, I run the risk of being much less interesting than both Ethan and Diana, because I'm not gonna have the, the eight of slides with very nice graphics on them, but uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna focus on a couple of our capacity building programs that USAID has. Uh, I sit in the Global Climate Change Office, so the kind of first and foremost um, objective of our work is climate change mitigation and adaptation, obviously for the clean energy space that's focused on mitigation. But our work is also centered very much around uh, private sector engagement, kind of sector development, market mobilization, maturation, these sorts of things. So I think there's um, a very strong connection to the market fundamentals and the mobilization of private sector finance, even as it relates to climate change mitigation efforts. Um, and to connect back to David's uh, call to action in the previous panel session regarding technical assistance, that is principally what we at USAID provide. And so the first of these uh, major programs I'll highlight is our Enhancing Capacity for Low Emissions Development Strategies Program. Um, it's been around for many years. It's a global initiative, and it's, it's a whole-of-government effort to basically work with countries to comprehensively, holistically plan their economic development, looking out over the long term and the idea behind this, obviously, is so that you can touch on some of these things that Jennifer mentioned about political stability, regulatory risk. I mean, the uncertainty that the private sector shies away from in terms of investing hundreds of millions, billions of dollars into sectors is strongly connected to their perception of enabling environment stability, regulatory risk, currency exchange risk, you know, poor, poor capacity and, and monetary policy dramatically affects that. And so we use the low emissions development strategies work as one way to say, 
Start at the very top, look across all your major potentially carbon intensive sectors and think about how you can strategically and kind of holistically plan those looking from now out to 30 years. And it typically starts at, you know, again, the kind of accounting, the taxonomy level of what the sectors are, but then it slowly leads down in terms of the capacity building implementation to thinking about, take for example, the energy sector. Do you need to unbundle and commercialize this space in order to obviously increase private sector participation, but also increase efficiency, whether or not your distribution or transmission companies are sufficiently collecting their revenues, they're addressing technical management losses in their lines, these sorts of things. And so the, the Low Emissions Development Strategies program really connects to every level and it trickles down through the energy sector to the capacity building of the regulator, capacity building of the key stakeholder, members of the stakeholder value chain, whether or not they're engineers, architects, uh, EPC contractors, or they're looking at the, the, finance, the commercial lender side. I mean, this could be another dimension of a low emissions development strategy itself that says the lack of participation in financing clean energy projects by local commercial banks is significantly hampering the scaling up of this infrastructure. And so that's another uh, great example of where this, this program can really touch on that capacity building of all the key members of the stakeholder value chain, uh, in this case, as an example for the energy sector. Um, to date, our countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that have this core program there are Ethiopia, Kenya, Ghana, and South Africa. Um, there are a number of other ones that I think we're considering you know, rolling out uh, in, and, and that's strongly connected to the recent Power Africa initiative that's came, come into being over the last couple of years. Um, I probably won't waver on the Power Africa program too much. I'm sure most people here have heard quite a bit about it. Uh, I know my, my colleague Andy Herskowitz was here last week um, discussing that. Obviously, that's kind of the elephant in the room in terms of USAID's work in sub-Saharan Africa for, for the energy sector. Um, but the, the low emissions development strategy work connects very strongly to that. It actually predates it, and now we're working to kind of roll out more of these LEDs programs in Power Africa countries. Um, the second program I want to highlight is a program that I'm the director of called the Private Financing Advisory Network, which is actually a multilateral initiative with 10 member countries. And this is focused on the entirely other end of the spectrum, more or less. So WED's thinking of this as very macro, whole of economy, top-down planning, capacity building. PFAN is a transaction project mentoring and advisory service that it's, it's actually uh, fortuitous for me that Ethan highlighted the Phoenix International Technology Platform because that's precisely the type of project that the PFAN program would seek to provide advisory or mentoring services to. Now the program doesn't provide any financing directly. That's where the OPICs or the MDBs or the impact investors of the world come in. But what it does do is it tries to identify projects that have obvious commercial promise and viability. They're not early stage, it's not doing you know, upstream project incubation and preparation, it's more mid to late stage you know, pre-commercial operations where you identify a project typically five to 10 million USD total investment range, so you know, the SME space, and you look at the project and say, you have tremendous commercial viability at your core business model, but a couple things. One, you haven't addressed fundamental kind of business model strategy risk issues. You know, have you considered this off-taker risk? Do you, are you sure about your, your land permitting? Uh, these sorts of things that you, you find a lot of these really viable kind of business model ideas that are just not sufficiently polished up to be at a bankable uh, level of quality. And so that's kind of the one part, very traditional kind of you know, consulting, financial advisory uh, input to these businesses like the Phoenix Internationals of the world to say, how can we get you financing? The second part is the actual matchmaking, which is say, okay, we've, we've kind of helped you polish up your business model here. Now you need to find someone that's going to write you a check. And there's two parts of that. One is the program maintaining a network of financiers and investors that are interested in this space. And that includes uh, you know, institutions as large as OPIC, all the way down to small, local kind of impact investors, high net worth individuals, et cetera. It says, okay, we need to, we need to get you introduced to some of the people in this community. 
That's one of the two big steps. The second one is literally the investment pitch. And what we say to them is, listen, you got a solid commercial business model here. You have 15 minutes. You get one cup of coffee on that first cup with this investor. If you blow it, you're not going to get invited back for the second cup of coffee. So put your suit on, you know, wear a tie. Well, fortunately, I'm not up here. But, uh, you know, if you have a 15, um, 15 slide deck, don't dedicate 10 of those slides to the social do-gooderiness of your project. Granted, that is an invaluable component of this, particularly when you're looking in the sustainable energy space. Two slides on that. But the investor wants to hear 80% of your discussion needs to be talking about your management team, your core business model, how you're structured financially, what the takeout periods are for them. I mean, you know, fundamental kind of commercial issues that any savvy investor or financier is going to want to hear about. So that's kind of the other part of that matchmaking service. Um, PFAN is, has been quite successful to date. It's mobilized just over 600 million uh, USD in investment globally, about a third of that um, towards Sub-Saharan Africa. We work in a strong kind of partnership and collaboration with the Power Africa Initiative. Again, the, I, I work uh, as kind of a technical advisor to the Power Africa program within USAID as well, so there's a lot of kind of cross-pollination and collaboration amongst our technical assistance programs. Um, and, you know, I think PFAN's a great example of a program that's, instead of addressing that kind of macro-scale political environment, enabling environment issues, which are paramount to really kind of maturing sectors, creating stable investment, attractive investment environments, it's one of those kind of grassroots, bottom-up um, approaches that says, there are a lot of good projects out there, typically this SME space, you know, where these companies don't have the in-house expertise to really develop their business models. They don't have the networks to, to find uh, the sources of money. But there are a lot of good projects out there, and, and, and Sub-Saharan Africa is probably one of the best examples of a region of the world where there is so much opportunity in that space. And then I, I just want to highlight how it connects specifically, again, to SSA in terms of the off-grid energy access issue. Um, you know, as, as Diana noted, you know, the, the cost in terms of grid expansion, getting grid connectivity to so many of these areas, I mean, I think the economics don't really weigh in favor of, of grid expansion in a lot of places right now. I mean, again, there's probably um, a tremendous amount of debate around this, but I think looking at that energy access, that off-grid application or solutions um, side of this is, is equally as important in sub-Saharan Africa as looking at the kind of utility scale, grid connected, grid expansion space. Because ultimately, there's a lot of energy needs now. There are tremendous hurdles in terms of the economics of grid expansion. So how do you bring, how do you bring modern energy services to these rural off-grid communities in the near term? And, and you know, advising projects, supporting uh, you know, the mobilization of investment for projects like Phoenix International, I think, is, is another great way to do that in terms of the off-grid space. So I think with, with that, I'll stop um, just highlighting two of USAID's technical assistance programs and turn it back over to Thanks. Jennifer. Thanks so much, Jeff. Yes, Jeff. Good morning. It's nice to be here. And uh, I noticed that since we started, the sun has come out and behind you all, so we'll, <laughs> we'll try to... Um, well, I, I want to speak today from the perspective of, of a, an investor whose uh, job it is, uh, whose commitment for, for, for 35 years or more has been to development and to electrification and all the things that we want to see happen and renewable energy in, in Africa and in developing countries in general. But at today, as an investor for the last 25 years, uh, who has to look for projects that return a good uh, return on equity uh, for uh, for these transactions, and from that perspective, uh, look at renewables in Africa. But I also want to start by picking up on something that Zephyr said, the coordination from the top down. Um, I asked uh, some of our team members on our forestry and our Africa growth investment team in Africa uh, to give me some ideas or just the context that they're dealing with uh, today in, in looking at uh, deals we're looking at all over Africa. And one of them said that uh, the, the big issue, in, especially in countries where they're largely dependent upon DFIs and external financing today, 
is, and this is speaking about Tanzania in particular, <clears throat> he said the country grid manager seems to stagger from grant to grant with an unclear strategic plan between uh, generation, transmission, distribution. And he wasn't even talking about renewables, he was talking about the bigger picture. And so what we see across the continent uh, and the, uh, is going on today is just this explosion of great projects, renewables, and in many areas, but it's not necessarily coordinated. And that raises a whole bunch of points that I want to pick up on in my remarks uh, uh, th based on the other, some of the other comments made by our panelists this morning. Um, first of all, the big context, of course, is huge economic growth uh, today, which is stunt stunted by the lack of electricity. We see it in Africa, There's, there, in South Africa, I mean, there are estimates that one to two percent of GDP growth is not available because they have blackouts today. Blackouts and brownouts in South Africa a few years ago with so much coal and so much access to so much hydropower, you wouldn't have believed it. Today in Santon, you know, our offices in, in Rosebank and in, in um, Melrose Arch, I mean, are, you know, are systematically being blacked out every, every day, practically. Uh, we see it across the continent in many other places. In Nigeria, industries cannot get reliable electricity, even those on the grid. Don't, they're down. The power's down all all the time. So the, these are tremendous issues. Um, there's deregulation. Uh, so people said before, there's less than 30 percent of the African population has real access to the grid. So that has uh, creates tremendous opportunities, but also perils for renewables that I want to come back to. Um, deregulation is going on. We're seeing the un unbundling and the privatization of electricity distribution in Nigeria right now. It's just an amazing process. I can't say it's led to any progress yet, but it's an amazing uh, shuffling of, of the deck. Uh, privatization of distribution uh, company in Uganda. The Kenya Power Company was listed um, on the Nairobi Stock Exchange. So as we look at renewables, I have a couple of uh, things to say about all that, about the demand, the pulsing demand for electricity. The two largest funding sources of, of new electricity generation today in Africa, we've kind of heard echoes of this, are IPPs, that's independent power companies, private sector, and China. China almost exclusively does coal, and almost all, in percentage of megawatts added, of the IPPs have been thermal. So, Let's be, make sure that we think about renewables in a realistic context. We can either, we can do one of two things. We can think of renewables as somehow outside that picture and providing things like village power and so on, or we can think of them uh, as a hand and glove inside the picture. And in my perspective, from my perspective today, and what we see in Africa, there is uh, now an emergence of substantial natural gas supplies, which will continue um, we, somebody asked about fracking resources or tight, tight gas, and, and there, there, are a lot, there will be uh, new tight gas. Uh, in, in South Africa, they're fighting it, but there seems to be huge resources in the Karoo. We're seeing more and more gas coming from Mozambique into South Africa. Remarkable to me is that we, uh, there's a company in, South, in Johannesburg called Egoli Gas, which has had the gas distribution franchise for many years. Believe it or not, they can't use the gas they're getting right now because all the boilers are, are you know, are, are coal. Uh, all the, there's not enough electricity. I mean, penetration beyond the ring of small transmission that they have. So, um, uh, to that but that natural gas opportunity is the same as I see it in the United States. Natural gas and renewables have to go hand in glove to really make a difference in terms of long-term offsetting that massive amount of coal and massive amount of other thermal power that, that, that um, uh, will be uh, generated otherwise. So just in the grid, for example, in many places in Africa, the grid cannot absorb renewables or cannot absorb more renewables or cannot absorb utility scale renewables because it's non-baseload power. So yeah, it works fine for village electrification in, you know, in small during the day and lighting a light at night, but thinking about large-scale electrification, we really need to think in a broader context. So I just wanted to start, you know, kind of give that overall picture that, that there's huge opportunities, but there are huge limitations if, if we're really thinking about renewables penetrating as part of the electrification demand of Africa. Uh, of course, we've seen uh, some amazing things going on. We've already talked about it. South Africa has created, uh, invested $14 billion, 64 projects, almost 4,000 megawatts in the last, since 2011 in renewables. 
We didn't participate in that because the equity return was low. But the remarkable thing is that's going into the ground and it's going on to the grid. That's more renewables power than anywhere across Africa in the last 20 years. But to think, think about this, one of the reasons they were able to do it, in addition to, uh, to essentially bidding out these power uh, contracts, is South Africa has, uh, as no other country in Africa, a huge banking system. So most of those projects were underwritten by a private banking system and credit service that, that really is completely different in most African countries. Most other African countries, the major financiers are the development finance agencies. So one thing that we need to think about is how to get more banking services, more of the commercial banks involved in lending and renewables across the continent, not just in, in South Africa. But you know we've had some uh, major progress in other areas as well. Um, uh, Kenya is now one of the leading uh, uh, producers of uh, solar ge geothermal biomass. They've had 12 projects and 100 megawatts in the last couple of years. Um, uh, Kenya is the eighth largest uh, geothermal uh, uh, generation in the world today because they've got good opportunities there. Cape Verde is today a net, uh, was a net importer of diesel five years ago, and today it's self-generating almost exclusively from wind because of the large projects which were financed through the African uh, Development Finance uh, uh, Facility. The project was developed. It took eight years to develop. So commercial projects wouldn't, commercial investors wouldn't have developed the project. But once the project was ready and PPA ready, it was taken over by commercial assets. So that's another, I think, a very positive role where the DFIs and like the OPIC and the USAID and other DFI programs can continue to play in both large and small scale renewables. We see huge challenges. Somebody mentioned earlier the land uh, and community issues. In renewables, land is, uh, you know, is really important, for, especially for the large-scale projects, the land costs, if you even can, can get the permissions and get, the, get it all aggregated, uh, could be a huge potential, uh, 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 so, I mean, a huge part of the whole uh, project. Um, we don't see local capital in many places, except South Africa. Um, to, to finance many of these renewable projects, so they are dependent on the large um, agencies. Um, so those are some of the, the challenges. Let me talk about a couple of the uh, opportunities that we see. Um, first of all, in distributed generation, there is an ability to leapfrog what is a limited ability of the grid to, to reach out. Um, there are, uh, you can do lower cost and quicker to market projects. We see. Um, private projects in very small so scale solar, up to a few, me a couple megawatts or less, going much faster than many of the projects, of the utility size projects that can take years and years to develop. Land acquisition may be much easier. Uh, we've had one group propose to us a set of uh, investments in, in Africa where they think just the land caught, they want to do one generation of solar. But actually, they think the land uh, 20 years from now or 25 years from now will be so much more valuable that the exit costs will be dismantling the solar and, and, uh, and using as a real estate investment. That's a better th thing than the uh, uh, residual co uh, value that many solar companies put on solar panels that won't have any residual value in the future. So think somebody said thinking outside the box from an entrepreneurial sense in Africa, those kind of solar facilities become the equivalent of the of the uh, rent and storage and warehouses that people build out near the future metro site, and they sit on it for 10 or 15 years, uh, getting low, relatively low level usage of the land, and then, then there's a higher usage later on. But that takes big capital, um, so, uh, so that's one of the challenges. Cogeneration and trigeneration and integration of uh, natural gas and um, and some renewables at the smaller scale level, I think, is as important as the big scale level. The reason it's important at the big level is because without that baseload power, the grids, the intermittent power of renewables can't be there. And so coal or other big biomass plants or other things are not, uh, are not as easy as, as natural gas to move up and down. So smaller scale natural gas systems can be part of the solution. Um, and in fact, we see both for gas, outside of the big, big usage in smaller areas, we see both for gas and for renewables and for, for biomass that some of the most cost effective projects have got to be those with heat and steam. Because if you're just generating electricity, coal almost anywhere trans transported or kerosene or diesel even in many cases can, can be a better deal. 
Um, but if you're looking at the sale of, of thermal and electricity, and in fact justifying it through electricity, many renewables, and in, in fact many biomass bio projects become very, um, very cost effective. And the reason I know this is because we're doing it. We've seen it. We have forestry, forest products investments in five countries of Africa where our team, we own majority control, we own these companies, and they're in rural areas, and we're, we're provide, we've realized that, for instance, in Tanzania, our teak plantations cannot get reliable electricity. But they also need heat for their, for their boilers and otherwise. In addition to that, some of our mills are realizing that there are industrial uses outside of their fence where they can uh, pipe over, even for companies that are getting electricity, they can pipe over steam and, and heat and, uh, and, and sell that, that product. So again, in rural areas where there's not reliable electricity, a combination of biomass for boilers uh, and other, other uh, uses even for electricity, then, then it's, it, it becomes uh, cost effective. Um, we're seeing in, um, in Nigeria in particular where there's a lot of, uh, of uh, flared and waste uh, residual gas or, or uh, that there are tremendous opportunities here um, in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, what I call the virtual pipeline. There are many industries. Nigeria is an incredibly industrialized country. People do not realize it until you're, until you're really working there. But 180 million people uh, and indu industries spread out throughout, throughout the country. So industries are needing reliable electricity more than anything else. Many of them will, not get a reliable, will never get a reliable grid, or they, they're not going to wait for it, and they can't wait for a pipeline from gas. So we're working with a company that is actually taking flared ga uh, gas is being flared now. The Nigerian government has signed international treaties making promises that they will no, long, no longer flare. I forget what the date is, but um, it's, we're being recovered and gathered. We're shipping it, uh, putting it through a shell uh, pipeline to the, to the pipeline terminus. Compressing compressed natural gas, not LNG, and this was what makes it cost effective, and distributing it in a trucking med mode uh, for, for industries. Now that can cover a, a vicinity of up to 200 miles, depending upon the infrastructure, the road infrastructure. But our customers, who are our customers? Well, Heineken Breweries has eight breweries around, around Nigeria, Coca-Cola the largest noodle maker in, in China. The noodle maker said to us, he's getting gas from pipeline for one of his like 10 plants around Nigeria. The, he said, when I hooked up that natural gas, I was saving 40, 50% on my energy uh, costs. I want natural gas elsewhere. He's not gonna get a pipeline out to his plants for many, many years. But we're, we put together the model, we can deliver it to him because his challenge is he, he needs reliable electricity for large batch production. Every time the electricity goes down in any one of his plants, the boilers go down and he loses, uh, he loses a product, basically. So, but, so that demand is driving uh, what I think of as a business-to-business -business enterprise here. There's no government involvement whatsoever in this. And these guys, these, these big pl these plants will never maybe go on the grid because they're going to be getting this. But now, think about, I, well, the reason I wanted to raise this is clean energy, and we love clean energy, and whoever else said it today that natural gas has got to be part of the equation I, uh, for the environment and for the real offset of carbon emissions, I think they're absolutely right. But think of the opportunity to do what, you, uh, what we were talking about before, about these small elect uh, village electric mini-grids. It really isn't, uh, really, the, the solar, unless you've got great wind power right there, it's going to be very difficult to give people more than a light bulb and that, that, that means local industry can't really thrive. So I, I love these small projects in Phoenix and everything else, but people want more than a light bulb and a cell phone because they need jobs. And, and local rural processing industries are, are d dying in Africa because they can't get reliable power. So we have to have reliable power. But take that, uh, that mini grid model, put together a natural gas virtual pipeline distribution Put all the renewables you can into that little mini grid and then augment it with a small 10 or 15 megawatt or smaller natural gas thing that gets served by a virtual pipeline and you've got a cost effective system. So I think you need to think about renewables in a much broader sense. I'm going to finish with two, uh, two thoughts here. Uh, first of all, we didn't talk a lot about biomass utilization. Because we see it from our forest products area, we see that there's a tremendous opportunity for biomass in, in Africa. First of all, there are many, many wastelands. If you look at the whole Afrom Plains of Ghana, it's, there's just basically waste, wasted land that can be planted for trees and then trees for, for power. 
But I'm not a big advocate of just these massive power plants burning biomass because nowhere in the world have they really, really worked all that great. They're trying to do something like that in Kenya, and they're projecting out the supply of biomass for the next 20 or 25 years from local woodlots. And I'm looking at it saying, I don't think you're going to, going to be caught, you're going to be able to get enough. But biomass, what we do in our forest plantations throughout Africa is we grow trees. And then we look at the trees and say, what's the best economic cost we can get from those trees? And, and uh, sawmilling and use, use of the lumber wood has not been cost effective in most parts of Africa. But today, the, the demand for lumber in Africa is, is growing faster than the availability of wood. If we can take that, that trend, the demand for lumber and the demand for wood, and combine it with using the biomass, the waste biomass, it suddenly makes much more economic our rural industries. We can employ more people, build the forest products and the uh, and for plantation forest industries. So again, hand in glove with industrial development, rural jobs, the opportunity to create more biomass as part of a larger industrial system. Um, there are, of course, many uh, challenges there, but, uh, but again, I think biomass plays a big, big um, limitation. Finally, you can't talk about all this unless you talk about the grid and the ability to transmit electricity. First of all, the largest source, the highest and best, most efficient source of renewable energy always, almost always, is efficiency and, and, uh, in, in transmission. Today, you have power lines throughout much of Africa, continental Africa, which have not been really replaced, barely maintained since independence. So you're talking about systems that are 40 and 50 years old. How do I know? Because we own a company here in the United States that does repair of, and maintenance <coughs> excuse me, of grids in the United States for power companies with helicopters. We found the guys, the Royal Air, former Royal Air Force guys, from RAF guys from South Africa, uh, who are doing this in South Africa, and they're doing it with many utilities. And they tell us that what they replace often is just crumbling resistors and, and all kinds, the wires, the, the long-term transmission. Some estimates have been as much as 45% of electricity is being lost in the transmission grid today. So without that, you can't really talk about renewables at the local uh, level. And then wires and poles. Think about this. You've got to have more transmission throughout Africa. Today, there are not enough poles in, in Africa. In fact, in Kenya, they're starting to make them out of cement, which is much more expensive and energy intensive. Than, they're importing poles in Ghana from, from Alabama. The wood resource is there. In fact, our plantations are now starting to grow trees specifically for poles for the future because there's going to be such a massive demand for electricity uh, transmission poles in, in the future. Um, so again, what I think is that if we build the renewables as part of this whole framework, we're really thinking about rural development. We're thinking about creating jobs. We're not just thinking about putting a solar here and a wind project there. We need to think about it as part of the whole long-term energy plan of Africa. Great. Um, thank you all four for a really um, thought-provoking, uh, informative uh, presentations. Um, what I get was kind of the idea of doing well by doing good, and I think that was Ethan's first point, um, you know, the, a change of mindset so that we're not pitting kind of this idea of feel-good development, um, you know, uh, get the slides on the business plan, even, even, uh, even while we're doing good, put on your business suit, even as you're selling a development project in a way. Um, the one question I had was maybe to look at other parts of the world, and you, you talked about kind of finding that you the risks of first projects, and you know what's it going to take to kind of be the tipping point. And I just wonder how that's worked in in a Latin America or other parts of the world um, that that you've worked in. I know that Africa is kind of lagging behind in this generally, but do you see a, is it is it going to be a couple of big projects and then a flood, or is it going to be a South Africa kind of leading the way and showing what's possible? I just wonder how, what a trajectory might look like. Um, I mean, I think for, um, I mean, for what we're seeing, at least if we're talking about smaller scale sort of off-grid energy solutions, I mean, the focus has certainly been Africa and India. I mean, those are the, the two places where everybody seems to be focusing. 
And when you get to the Phoenix types of products, there are a lot of companies. There's one called B-Box, there's Phoenix, there's Off-Grid Electric. There are a lot of these companies that are focusing on these small scale in the home, you know, one light bulb, cell phone charging type of solar suit. And there, there are so many of them that in my view, I mean, at some point there's gonna have to be some kind of consolidation or, or someone's gotta figure out which business plan really works the best for expansion, you know, on a large scale. Uh, even though there are an awful lot of rural areas to cover, I think that it's unlikely that all of these companies will, will succeed. And then I think, you know, the regulatory environments and the, I mean, the land issues, I mean, there, there's so many elements that come into play that uh, that is sort of a critical component as well. I mean, for instance, when you're a lender looking at one of these projects, that is, you know, you're setting up a little solar installation in a number of villages, you know, do, does the developer have rightful access to that little piece of land in each, in each village that they're using? I mean, we cannot spend, hire lawyers to look at every lease agreement and every, so there are a lot of complexities in developing these. And I think that going forward, the way they're gonna be successful is if lenders can kind of find a way to do them on a portfolio basis, where you're aggregating a lot of small projects together, you're diversifying your risk among a number of smaller projects, and, and then, you know, that is something that is more scalable than just these one-off, very intensive uh, financings where you're doing the same kind of analysis that you're doing on a large one. Mm -hmm. And and you're trying to avoid legal costs, you're trying to avoid engineering costs, you're trying to avoid all these costs to make it affordable and taking more risks. So I think that it's just sort of an evolution of, of you know, scale, of getting everybody's, you know, figuring out which which developers have the best ideas and, and backing them because then they're the ones who will be able to scale. So it, it's kind of a winnowing out and, and figuring out who's doing what and, and, and who's got the best ideas and then supporting those. And, and then on a larger scale, I mean, I think for especially in, you know, I mean, if you're looking at hydro, wind and, and solar, I mean, all those big projects will continue. Um, you know, we, I mean, we've seen, I think we now have 600 million in exposure in Chile alone in solar. So it's, it's, you know, it's really getting huge. And we see these business plans all the time, you know. If I could just add a couple of quick thoughts. Well, one, you know, um, uh, well, first, the, just uh, on the concept of off-grid versus on-grid, Look, none of this stuff is mutually exclusive when you're talking with, you know, whatever the number is, half a billion people without, you know, proper energy access on the continent. Some people, a light bulb is a major step up, and for some, you know, they're ready to move much beyond that. So, I mean, I think, um, and I, you know, to Diana's point, there are a lot of different firms operating in this, but one thing I've never heard them say is we don't have enough opportunity. I mean, there's so many people who, have, who, who could use more access. Um, that, they, that, you know, that they, they don't find themselves directly competing with each other really pretty much ever yet. That may change. Um, so, you know, whether you go the, you know, the, 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 the Pico, you know, tiny scale route of Phoenix or you go a mini grid route, which Diana was talking about, you talk about larger projects like Jeff's talking about, you know, these do not have to be mutually exclusive. I do think, though, there have been issues in some cases with local um, policy makers and some, and particularly grid companies uh, or utilities uh, and their regulators in some of these countries not being open to uh, off-grid activities taking place, not keen on, on um, mini-grids um, where they can't price the electricity. Um, and so I do think there does need to be some flexibility in the thinking on the part of policy makers and being open to different types of solutions, and that's not, frankly, not always the case that's out there. Um, one quick thought on the Latin American example in question, um, just that uh, a couple trends that I think we've seen in LATAM, and first of all, there are limits in terms of comparisons. Frankly, the Latin American countries are typically more, more likely to be middle income countries or further developed. Um, they have higher electrification rates in almost every case. They have you know, much more extended grids. But what has sparked the market um, for renewables in a lot of those countries has been the holding of tenders or auctions for power contracts. 
And that's frankly pretty much exactly what we've seen in South Africa too, which is probably the most sort of you know on par. Maybe Kenya is in there as well, and Nigeria. Um, but in terms of being close to the level of development of a lot of Latin American countries, and that has really keyed off the market. Um, and we saw that take place in you know, Peru, Brazil, Panama, other places you know, across, uh, across uh, LATAM. One other thing that I would say for lesson learned from LATAM, and really to, to Jeff's point, um, is on dedicated power projects um, for industrial customers. And I think, Jeff, you're talking about doing for, you know, with, with, net, with net gas and flaring, et cetera, or cogen. Um, but in, in, um, you know, in places like Chile and elsewhere, you know, people are running, um, you know, doing industrial operations based off of, you know, wind or solar um, because they want to lock in a price for electricity. They don't want to be reliant on an unreliable grid. Um, and so they'll make that investment to finance or just buy the, the power from a local project that basically is, you know, by, under bilateral contracts and have little to nothing to do with the grid uh, overall. And we could definitely see more of that I think that doesn't need to be confined to, to gas in, in Africa. I think it certainly could be other technologies as well. We could very well see more of that also. I want to take a round of questions. Maybe I'll just throw one into the hopper too, which is what does the low oil price mean for this? Are we going to see a plummet to, of that upward graph in terms of investment and financing? Um, but maybe we will take a few from the audience and then come back to our speakers if we have. Yes. Uh, one and two up in the first row. Um, I'm Peggy Thompson. I work for Ormat Technologies, which is one of the sorry one of the companies that was uh, successful working with Orm, uh, OPIC and has opened a cut a ribbon on a 110 megawatt project in Kenya and expanding it by 24 more megawatts. It was a really successful partnership with OPIC, um, and that relationship predated Power Africa. It started before Power Africa was born. But I'm interested. Um, Zephyr and Diana with the expanded aperture of the Power Africa program to grow the goal and also to go beyond those six initial countries, how your strategy is changing, um, if at all. And then right behind you. Hi, I'm Ian Butterfield from Pace Government Relations. A question for Ethan. And thinking back to your slide where you showed the, reliable, the proper return on investment for wind and solar, what does that slide look like if you incorporate pump storage or battery storage? Um, gentleman here. Hi, uh, Sasanka with Oxfam. Thanks for all of that. Um, I, I want to touch just very quickly on, you know, when we talk about MDBs or DFIs, you know, the D in those, the development aspect. Um, and a lot of the times, the environmental and social externalities, uh, the non-climate related, if you want to call them, land, water, uh, governance, don't get factored in. Um, when a lot of the times, renewable energy sources tend to be, have a better price when you try to price those in. The IMF tried to do it and came up with around 400% cheaper, actually. Um, how are you assessing that? And this is to all of you, whether it's in your strategies that you do, Zephyr, or in the investment decisions, Diana and Jeff, or Ethan in your cost curves, pricing in these environmental and social externalities, which could probably push the uh, renewables uh, envelope even further. <coughs> Thank you, Jennifer. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, excellent panel. I like all your comments. I have too many questions, and I want to ask them because we don't have enough time. Just a point going back to Ethan's slide uh, that he showed the percentage of Africans without access to electricity. And piggybacking what Jeff said, much of which I agree with and some I disagree with, I can talk to Jeff otherwise. Um, with the population growth in Africa currently, and with the current number of people without access to electricity, even by the year 2030, you could end up having still probably 700 million people without access to electricity. Many of them actually will live in the cities, not in the rural areas. And if we look at Germany and California today, rooftop solar is being put in cities, not in rural areas. So I kind of would like to get your perspective on it's to sort of a change the narrative and, and not just talk about rural electrification and rooftop solar for the rural areas, but you have significant parts of sub-Saharan Africa in the cities, in Lagos, 25 million people, where you don't have access to electricity. So I think if you come into Lagos and you say bring rooftop solar to Lagos through some tax credit uh, measure by the government, you will see electricity prices drop significantly in Lagos. So I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that because that's my main concern, is that we think that rural PV is only for the rural areas, but the vast majority of these 
people growing up in Africa are now in the cities, and that's where you have huge uh, power uh, gaps. How do we fill that, and how do we change this narrative so that PV doesn't become something for the rural areas, but is actually something to address energy access issues? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Ajutu from Uganda. Uh, you talked about uh, a number of issues, uh, but I am interested in, in finding out uh, what's, uh, what's the coverage of this funding, because most of these renewable energy sources are really, m there's little information on about it. Do we look at studies? Do we look at on the development? That's the first thing. Then two, if you look at uh, the cost, the unit cost of delivering these services to the off grids especially, it's a bit expensive and makes it a bit unaffordable. And yet you'll find that if you develop it, you structure it on the basis of the communities, you'll be wasting these resources. So what does the program do to fully develop the, the potential of the resources to maybe with the possibility of feeding it into the national grid? And then also on the issue of um, uh, on the issue of ethanol, uh, we talked about the, the the biomass and what have you. Uh, there is a huge debate on the issue of food security because if you are going to develop these energy sources, how what are we going to do about the food security concern? Thank you so much. So I'll start with the, the easy, well, easy, the softball question about a USAID program. Um, how has, if at all, how has Power Africa's uh, operational strategy changed with the increase in its uh, regional footprint? And that is essentially now all of Sub-Saharan Africa is kind of fair game to be called Power Africa in terms of our uh, energy work there. So, um, at the risk of hopefully not being redundant to comments that Andy made last week, uh, the, the global coordinator, I would say that there's no fundamental change in the strategy. Um, the issues, and this kind of goes back earlier to the question you asked, Jennifer, in terms of what's unique about Sub-Saharan Africa, I would say looking even within the region, the set of issues are relatively uniform in terms of the, their existence. It's really the scale or significance that they play in driving the lack of uh, functionality of these sectors, if you will. And I would say that that's a relatively accurate statement globally. I mean, pretty much around the world, even in the you know sophisticated Western energy markets, you have kind of a suite of issues, whether the regulatory, enabling environment, these sorts of things, uh, commercial fundamentals, you know, how the financial markets operate, et cetera. So I think in terms of the way Power Africa's expansion is thinking about this is we just have a, an increased set of uh, opportunities to address this kind of ecosystem of challenges. In, in one country, we may focus a lot more on one organism in that ecosystem. Let's use uh, kind of large utility scale transaction advisory work as one example. You know, that kind of pilot demonstration project uh, opportunity to really build that capacity of the regulator, of the private sector developers, um, et cetera, in, in one market. Ethiopia's uh, Corbetti geothermal plant is, is really a, a great example of that. But then in another market, say Nigeria, we might want to disproportionately focus our uh, TA efforts through Power Africa on another kind of entity in that, in that ecosystem, and that might be the political and regulatory environment. You know, thinking about how can we get them to establish um, transparent permitting and approval laws for IPPs to plug into the grid? Can we get them to uh, develop a feed-in tariff, or even better yet, um, stand up a, a more competitive reverse auction procurement environment? And so I think that all of these issues are at play, whether or not it's uh, getting value from supporting specific transactions as kind of the pilot demonstration effect um, approach, or it's supporting this very kind of big picture enabling environment, you know, regulatory policy issues, setting targets, et cetera. So um, it's, I know it's a long-winded answer, but the, the short answer is there's no fundamental change. It's, you know, these issues exist everywhere, and in, in specific context, uh, you might want to focus 
more on one side than the other. It's almost like thinking about having a sports team. And if, you're, if you don't have a, a good center, you go out and you look for a good center in your basketball team. And if, if you go and you're coaching another team and you don't have a good guard, then you want to go out and develop your guards. But at the end of the day, you need to have a good center and you need to have good guards to have a really effective team. Uh, it, well, yeah, do you want to talk about the extern how you factor externalities into some of these uh, top-down or maybe you want to take another question. But no, sure, I can, I can address that as well. Um, so I think in USAID's context, it's probably slightly different than what you're going to hear uh, from OPIC or the Jeff, and, and that's because we are focused on technical assistance. So we are not actually in the position of costing directly environmental ex externalities, and whether that's, you know, pure kind of, or so I should say environmental and social externality. So whether or not that's pure environmental impacts uh, or it's kind of, you know, social displacement, these sorts of things. Our efforts on that front are really focused at champion, uh, being a champion for the inclusion of those factors. Also, gender equality is a big one. And, in specific context, we will definitely be doing these analyses that are kind of focusing on, you know, certain prices, if you can quantify these sorts of things, certain prices or certain uh, aspects of these kind of social, environmental, et cetera, issues that need to be included when considering uh, whether or not to undertake various infrastructure projects. But I would say in general, we tend to be a lot more focused at just kind of uh, being cheerleaders to say you need to include these things. They're very critical. Their prices, if you will, and as, and as much as you can uh, monetize them, their prices will vary, but they are, they are very significant. And I think, you know, at least anecdotally, you've seen this in a lot of places in the world. And you know, going back to the comment about uh, land rights and access, I mean, this has been a huge issue. And in Central America um, is a good example of a place I've been working a lot recently. You know, the, Guatemala has a tremendous amount, of Honduras as well, a tremendous amount of promise in terms of what they've done on kind of the regulatory front to promote the investment attractiveness of renewables, but they've had tremendous social unrest uh, from the development of these projects. And I think that that lends itself to this idea that there needs to be just a more comprehensive, a more in-depth analysis of these other kind of ancillary or externality issues that maybe are traditionally outside that kind of conventional realm of, of project finance structuring. So uh, turn it over, I guess. Well, on the CO2 thing, I don't, know, I don't know, Diana, if you want to jump in on that. But we don't do it. I mean, it's very simple. I mean, we, our, our clients are investors. They want to know about return on investment on, um, on a financial basis. We're not environmental consultants, so it's not a calculation we do. I don't know. Do you guys do it? Uh, we, you know, we really don't see a lot of, uh, a lot of pro projects anymore that were, it's, a, it's an issue for us. I mean, I think that... Um, you know, in the past, we saw a lot more conventional power, and it, w it was more of a concern for us. But the vast majority of the projects we see are all in the renewables. I mean, in fairness, I think it's a, it's a fair point to make. I think there's social costs. It's just, like I said, that's not really our, that's not what we do. I, you know, it's a funny thing, but there is a natural uh, pricing of externalities. Oh. Uh, there's a natural pricing of externalities in Africa because uh, if you look at uh, coal or diesel kerosene in big ports areas of Africa where, the, where there's relatively easy access, it's, uh, uh, it's, let's just say it's priced $50, $60 equivalent a ton. But it delivered in landlocked areas, in, you know, and either even cities in, in landlocked areas of Africa, because of the transportation and infrastructure, it's, it could be three times that amount. And so that's where, uh, for even small and growing urban communities and so on, renewables may be uh, that much more competitive. In Lagos, it's going to be a difficult uh, thing unless the government decides or the utility decides just to give a, a consumer uh, credit or some kind of a chit for everybody who puts a solar panel on their roof, which is essentially what's happened in, in the U.S. and, and, and Japan and, and Germany. But uh, uh, I don't think you're going to see a lot of, it's difficult to do like large scale solar projects or wind projects in the, in the urban areas. But um, again, the opportunities, I think, are in these growing and thriving rural areas. Uh, somebody uh, also asked the question about uh, food security. 
Uh, one of the things we see is there's a real potential for competition of land in Africa in the future if suddenly people start doing all kinds of things like uh, uh, growing trees for power, big power plants. You could have a competition with food and so on. But remember, electrification probably is the number one need for food security in Africa. Something like 30 to 40 percent of all produce and so on can't get to market, so it's not commercialized, or rots before it gets to market because of the lack of processing and, and low industrial uh, capabilities in many rural areas. So again, I just, I just want to make sure uh, that all of us, as we think about renewables, we think about it at beyond just, oh, we, we love to have a solar plant here, but think about it as part of an, a rural and an industrialization process that needs to go on in Africa. So uh, again, I, I do love the Phoenix, and I do love light bulbs, and I think some people like it, but it's not creating jobs. Whereas if you had a small grid where people could get jobs because there's industry and there's agricultural processing and all those things, that's, the, that's, that's what I want the development agencies to really focus on is some, a bigger picture. Think about rural electrification in the United States. Did you know that 60% of all electricity supplied to households in the United States is supplied by rural development cooperatives created under the Roosevelt administration. Even today, those cooperatives, we wouldn't have rural electri electrification in much of the United States today if we didn't have that system. So let's, let's think about those bigger models and how in Africa we can help African countries and African companies to d develop these models. Uh, before we move on, I just want to address the gentleman's um, question about development of clean energy resources in the urban context. I think it's, it really is, you know, it, an issue that is getting so much increasing attention and really does deserve kind of a disproportionate response when you look at these kind of global rates of urbanization, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. And I think that, you know, I, I won't speak uh, for the entirety of the kind of development community, but I think there is uh, some work to get caught up in terms of the learning curve on what can be done in the urban context when it comes to kind of sustainable energy um, infrastructure investment and design. I don't think there is any panacea or silver bullet answer to this, but um, you know, one promising thing in terms of that kind of grid access, grid expansion issue that we've touched on already is in the urban context, obviously geographically, the density is tremendous. And so I think the distributed generation uh, economics or kind of value proposition is not as strong. Whereas in that case, if you can get a reasonable transmission infrastructure set up in terms of line losses, et cetera, you can really take advantage and exploit those economies of scale from that utility scale management of, of energy generation as long as you can get the, the, the lines to all the houses. And I understand that that's, that's kind of a, a separate you know, and tremendously challenging problem in and of itself. But I think that the urban context really gives us a unique advantage in terms of economies, uh, economies of scale and the way that we address this issue in terms of access to energy, you know, whatever the elect wherever the electrons are coming from, and then principally access to renewable and other clean energy. So. Just if I guess if we're going to kind of go through all these questions in kind of a random order, but if I could touch on a few things. So I guess first to Lawrence's point and, and to Zephyr's point on, on um, urban photovoltaics, look, I think there's real promise there. I think it's the same, it's going to be the same math though in Lagos as it's going to be, you know, in um, San Francisco, which is what's the retail price of electricity for someone? Um, if it's ridiculously expensive, then putting a system up on the roof can work. Um, but uh, yes, so that yes, that can work. But of course, then the issue of financing, um, and um, which is actually the same both in San Francisco and in Lagos. Again, is most homeowners don't have the capital to put something like that up on their on their roof. What kind of credit programs can be made available to facilitate that? I I assume it's trickier in the African context. Uh, I don't know, but I assume it is. Then certainly in. Um, you know, in the context of the U.S., but um, but some of the retail, and we look at this in our climate scope project, some of the retail rates of electricity being paid by consumers in Africa are insane. I mean, they're really, really high. And so, yeah, the, on, the, on, the, on that basis, it could Particularly potentially Particularly when you put work. in diesel backup. Yes. Because if you're in Lagos, you know that anybody who has any means at all has a diesel backup uh, to, yeah. for their electricity. Yeah. So, very expensive. Okay, so on the question about the um, pump storage, 
It's a very, and, and um, storage associated with renewables and how that changes the economics. It's a very good question. It gets at, frankly, the fundamental problem. There's no perfect way to measure energy economics. And levelized cost of electricity is problematic in the sense that what I showed you is on a per megawatt hour basis. It doesn't take into account the point that Jeff was making about intermittency and the fact that, yeah, you're going to get a capacity factor if you're lucky on a wind farm. If you're really lucky in the 40s, more likely in the 20s or 30s. Um, and so associating it with some kind of storage is, is obviously, there's uh, enormous opportunities there. If I were to simply just add on a cost onto the LCOE, though, it would simply, it would move the line up, right, because you'd have this additional cost, but obviously there'd be the attributes of being potentially 24-7 in terms of providing the power. Um, but on storage in particular, there's some very exciting things going on with battery technologies right now. Um, and it's actually not really a technology trend. It's more just a sheer uh, production trend. Uh, the volume of lithium ion, the, the, the capacity of lithium ion battery manufacturing is enormous. It far exceeds the market right now. And it's basically crashing the price. Uh, and um, it's making lithium ion batteries much more affordable. That doesn't necessarily mean they're the best technologies to be associated with this kind of thing. Um, but it becomes kind of a, a, v, you know, a, a, a VHS versus Betamax kind of thing, where this is maybe the cheapest solution, and it may start to become more meaningful. All that said, right now we do a lot of looking at the calculations, and in most cases, associating power storage with generation locally is a tough thing to do on an economic basis. It's changing, but it's not really, really there. I don't know, Jeff, you want to add anything? I just want to add that uh, there's one success story that I know of in Africa, and that's Morocco with pump storage where they have added a lot of megawatts through pump storage in the last five or 10 years by systematically surveying everywhere they can do it. But to your point, Ethan, it's really associated with the entire amount of, of uh, it's peak load, it's on, the, it's on the grid, so it's not associated with any particular uh, uh, other renewable uh, projects. But I'm sure there are other countries, uh, many countries in Africa where you could do uh, pump storage, particularly where there is large power demand in big urban areas and, and it spikes during the day or during seasons. And then last, I'll try and answer, and then I, hopefully everyone else has thoughts on this too, on the oil price, which is a really interesting question. Um, a couple of years ago, we did a study looking at um, essentially the break even for um, using oil versus uh, selling it uh, in the context really of Saudi Arabia, which I think is about 40 or 50 percent of their power generation came from, um, from, um, from burning oil. Um, and at the time, you know, we basically, then oil was trading at 100, 110 bucks a barrel. And I think we basically wrote, this is crazy. They shouldn't be burning oil um, to light the houses um, in Saudi Arabia. They should be selling it on the, on the international market. And then they should be paying, you know, something, you know, the break even was somewhere around $80 per barrel, um, which you could do solar at. Um, obviously, we're below $80 a barrel now. So for countries that um, have local oil, um, you know, production and conserve their load using oil, you, you know, burning oil, the economics just got a lot better. I mean, let's, let's be honest about it. Um, and I think we're going to certainly see that in a number of countries. The other place is, uh, the other place where I think when we were, Diana and I were talking about this briefly before we came in here, is on this question of micro scale distributed um, uh, solar in particular, but other technologies as well. That final, you know, liter of, of kerosene um, that you know somebody you know lugs out to the village to, to basically run the generator. Um, wh what has happened to the price of that liter of kerosene in the wake of what's happened in the last six months? I don't exactly know the answer. I mean, there's two schools of thought. One, the price has come down, obviously, because the original price of the oil has come down. But others would argue that, that there's a lot of costs associated with actually getting it out onto site and all kinds of things that people, you know. Uh, you know, transport costs, and those have not been really affected by any of this, and thus the economics haven't changed that much. So I don't, any, I don't know if anybody has any other perspectives on it, but my, my sense is that it hasn't changed overnight in that context. Now, I would just add that in general, I mean, we certainly haven't seen any kind of shift yet in the pipeline of transactions that, that are being brought to us. I mean, so we are largely reacting to what investors are doing, right? So if someone, you know, approaches us with a, with a project to finance, we'll look at it. And of course, these are the kinds of risks we would analyze as, as part of that, that financing. And, um, you know, for these very large scale renewable energy projects, they are certainly those business plans are still coming in the door. And so from the investor's perspective, 
I don't see that they seem to be thinking that um, the drop in oil prices is, is particularly affecting their business plans right now, but I think it might remain to be seen depending on how long this continues, right, and how, uh, how uh, developers start to adjust their, their uh, you know, their business plans long term, potentially. So, but no, I, I haven't noticed any change right now. Yeah. Jeff, do you, you get the last uh, kind of wrap-up word? You can take one of these. Uh, um, well, in Nigeria right now, we have we did help hold up the closing of our investment, as I mentioned to you, in this uh, natural gas virtual pipeline, uh, precisely because we thought that the Nestle's or the Heineken's or others who are now burning uh, other fuels in their burners might be less willing to sign long-term contracts and, and transition. Remarkably, we haven't seen any change. And I think it's because the inconvenience and the difficulty of using these other fuels and burning them um, uh, and uh, the, the inability to get natural, to get uh, reliable electricity combines with them looking at the whole cost and the, and the price of petroleum or alternative fuels is only one, one piece of it. So um, I, I think that's where we'll have the least effect. I think, uh, back to Diana's point, the kerosene and other things that are transported into villages and so on, uh, again, in my opinion, the, the, the ultimate, the, the original cost of the petroleum is still a small cost compared to all the different usurial uh, ways that people extract money and the, the transportation costs for, for infrastructure and everything else. But one more thing, somebody mentioned the, the utilities. Uh, uh, sort of resisting this transition to having renewables. It's absolutely true. We've seen it. We saw it for years in South Africa with ESCOM. They finally got broken uh, on that one. But we had renewable projects many years ago that we just couldn't do because ESCOM essentially said, we have a, we have a, a outside of your fence, outside of your mills for electricity, we have a, a monopoly on generation. Um, I would be really interested, and I haven't done this for somebody, but somebody should look at the privatization contracts in Nigeria, for example, the, the private sector groups that have bought into uh, new, uh, you know, new uh, privatized utilities and in other countries, they're betting on a certain price, they're betting on a certain number of customers, and what happens when they, when the, when in the future when renewables really start, small scale renewables really start to become aggressively undermining their, their, con their customers. I don't know what they say, but I would bet you it's going to be a resistance point in the future. We are at time. I know there's a couple of questions that are still unanswered, um, but uh, I hope you'll, you'll, uh, you'll forgive me for cutting off. Um, listen, I want to thank our panel. There's a whole lot of information packed into those presentations. I'm going to have to rewatch the webcast on that. Uh, I hope at, f at future sessions we can maybe get some policymakers from the African context to talk about how they're looking at it and how they're uh, looking at the, the broad uh, national strategies. Uh, I want to thank you all for, for being patient and, again, thank our panelists for really rich um, presentations. Thanks. Thank